Good evening. The Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District Board of Trustees is now convened in the regular board meeting on Thursday, April 4th, 2024, in the boardroom of the Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District at the Mark Henry Administration Building at 6 p.m. I want to welcome our members of the audience, our viewers online, to meet the Board of Trustees. We are here to set goals, listen to reports, approve budgets, contracts, personnel appointments, and make policy for the district. It's not the role of the district to make day-to-day -day operation decisions. The management and day-to-day -day operation decisions of the district are responsible to the superintendent. We have policies and procedures in place to resolve concerns and issues. This is the meeting of the public of Board of Trustees, not a meeting of the public. The, P the meeting is open to all who wish to attend and matters discussed. Audience members may not participate in the meeting outside the designated agenda items or citizen participation. Disruption of the meeting by any person, including the audience, is inappropriate and will be addressed by the board president or the board council. Continue to repeat the disruption of the board by words or actions may result in removal. Prior to the meeting, board members received information related to tonight's meeting. Agenda items may not be handled in the order they're listed on the notice. During the course of the meeting, the board may determine that a closed session is needed. In an event, the, beetle, the board will meet in closed session, consider a duly matter posted as meeting in sections 551.071 through 551.084 of the Texas Government Code. These proceedings are live on the district website. They are also available on the district website following tonight's meeting. For the video to adequately reflect the proceedings, I respectfully ask that you please refrain from talking while others are speaking and cell phones are turned in silent mode. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening and you're interested in the Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District. At each open meeting, the board, patrons who have registered in accordance with the procedures established in BED regulation may address the board during the designated agenda comments. Part of the board's consideration on action items, unless the agenda is otherwise rearranged by the board present during the meeting. Also in accordance with the with, with procedures of BED regulation, patrons may address the board during citizen participation on matters of interest concern not posted on agenda items. For detailed information or instructions on registering, to speak on agenda comments or citizen participation, please go to the district website at cfisd.net. Patrons who have registered to speak tonight will see their names listed on the screen. Before your name is called, please move forward and sit in the reserved seats on the front row. The invocation for tonight's meeting will be given by the Reverend Joseph Carmelo. He's a senior pastor of Life Family Church in Cypress, Texas. Pastor Joseph is in lovely and called by church members, is native Houstonian, and a diehard love for Houston sports teams. The Reverend believes that, that investing in students of our community through kindness acts of service will produce long-lasting results for future generations. Thank you, Reverend Joseph, for being here tonight. Before the invocation, I'd like to introduce the Cypress Ridge High School Air Force JROTC cadets who will present tonight's colors this evening. Carrying the U.S. flag is Cadet Chief Master Sergeant Alicia Dorsey. The U.S. Coast Guard is Cadet Tech Sergeant Yuo Perez. Carrying the Texas flag is Cadet Staff Sergeant Vivian Goodwin. And the Texas Guard is Cadet Sergeant Angel Zamora. These cadets present the colors under the direction of Senior Master Sergeant Sergeant James Corr, retired U.S. Air Force. At this time, I'd ask you to please stand for the invocation and then the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. <laughs> Dear loving Father, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for life itself. And thank you for our family and friends that bring joy to our life journey. Thank you for giving us the measure of health that we need to fulfill our purposes. Thank you for the opportunity to be involved in meaningful and lasting work and for the honor of serving our community. In your sacred writings, it says that you have established those in authority to promote peace and justice. It also says that we ought to pray for our officials, that we may live a peaceful life marked by godliness and dignity. Therefore, I pray for our superintendent. I pray for our school board officials. I am asking you that you would grant them wisdom in dealing with the agenda that is before them, confidence to do what is right for our district, the ability to work together in unity even when there are genuine philosophical differences. And I pray many blessings upon their lives 
and grant them joy that is in their callings. Lastly, I ask you to keep the students, the faculty, and all of the staff safe at all times and during every occasion. In your name we pray. Amen. May we say it, please. At this time, Dr. Blassinga will read the district's vision and mission statement. Our vision at CFISD is formed from the acronym LEAD, to learn, empower, achieve, dream, lead. Our mission is to maximize every student's potential through rigorous and relevant learning experiences, preparing students to be 21st century global leaders. Thank you, Dr. Blyas, again. There are no speakers this evening for agenda comments. We'll now proceed with remarks and agendas and announcements portion of the agenda. The superintendent will make remarks regarding tonight's honors and achievements. Dr. Kelly. Thank you, sir. Um, CFI, CFI, ISD students, man, I was having a hard time with that one. <laughs> CFISD students and staff shine through the month of March. Please enjoy this March recap video highlighting how our students and staff brought out the best. The bringing out the best character trait for the month of April is diligence. Thank you to all our campuses for emphasizing strong character for all of our CFISD students. Also, the inaugural Community Science Festival was held on March 23rd at Cypress Ridge High School, a celebration of science for CFISD students, family, and community members. Please enjoy this video recap from the event. So today is our inaugural science festival for our community. So it's open to the entire district from elementary to high school and our special campuses as well. About a year and a half ago, we had the idea that we wanted to really showcase what science can be and what opportunities there are in science inside Fair ISD. This reached out and I thought this would be a fantastic event for our community, right? It's, you know, it's an opportunity for them to come by and stop by, experience things uh, that uh, really have no cost, you know, get kids excited in science, which I think is an important uh, piece. We have everything you can think of from life science to earth science, astronomy. We'll have a star party outside. We've got solar binoculars and telescopes. 
The community is uh, able to come and see that, again, science happens outside of the classroom and that science is accessible even in my own backyard or in my kitchen. So we're, we're helping people see that science is everywhere. Congratulations to Copeland Elementary School for winning the district Name That Book competition held March 26th at the Berry Center. Third, fourth, and fifth grade students coached by their librarians represented 37 campuses. After hearing a clue, just a clue, students had 15 seconds to identify a title from a list of 100 books. That's pretty incredible. Um, congratulations also to the regional winners, including Black, Post, Emory, Rennell, and Lee Elementary Schools. National Assistant Principals Week is this week, April 1st through the 5th, and we join the celebration of our dedicated campus leaders throughout the CFISD district. I'd also like to just uh, tell everyone to please walk up to an assistant principal and just thank them for what they do. That would be really nice. That would be a change, so. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I was an assistant principal, so that's a, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, yesterday, April 3rd, was Public School Paraprofessional Day, a time to recognize the thousands of paraeducators across the district who bring out their best in our students. And we really would like you to walk by and say hi and thank you to those folks as well. They do an outstanding job. Um, today is also April, uh, April 4th is uh, National School Librarian Day. Thank you to all of our incredible librarians who instill a love of reading in our students and so much more, including coaching the Name That Day, uh, Book competition. So thank them very much and please stop by the library and, and say we appreciate you. Uh, the Career Fair, a reminder that the CFISD Career Fair is scheduled for April 17th from 4.30 to 6.30 at the Berry Center. Interested applicants can pre-register for the fair at cfisd.net slash career fair. Uh, teacher Workday, just a reminder that on Monday, April the 15th, it's designated as a teacher workday and a student holiday. So students, we appreciate you, but don't come to class that day. All right, so um, I wanted to just take another point of personal privilege since I've made this a habit um, at the last couple of meetings. I had the pleasure and the honor of going over to one of our campuses where we have a clothes closet for our kids and our, our community. So, um, and it was a wonderful event. Actually, I met uh, Sandy Martin, the secretary, and uh, Charles Martin, her husband, the treasurer of the Houston Sci-Fair Lions Club. And I'm also a lion, so it was kind of a kick to show up there and um, help them unload all the clothes that they had collected to donate to our clothes, uh, our clothes closet. So, and um, I just wanted to say a special thank you to a couple uh, folks that were there. Um, Franklin Sampson, our director of counseling, and then just also a number of folks that are on the closed closet team, uh, Kimberly Hines, uh, Karishma Taylor, uh, Carrie Harris, uh, Yasina Menza, um, Samantha Chakota, and then Ariel Shackelford. So the reason why I wanted to thank them was when you walked into what was essentially a portable, you walked into a prom shop. So they had set up the entire portable as basically a retail store. And so kids that really needed prom gear could walk in there and have a real retail experience when they couldn't afford to go out and do that. And these folks put a lot of effort into it. I mean, even the shoes were stacked up like it was um, a shoe store and they were nicely displayed. And I went back and I told my wife and she said, you know, we're moving. I have a bunch of shoes that, um, and then they told me also that at the store that they really need men's outfits. Um, and they even take short fat men like myself. So um, apparently that's a suit that they might need. So um, if you have anything, we really would like you to contact. Um, I think you could contact uh, Franklin Simpson and he would definitely make sure it gets to the right place. I'm bringing a bunch of ties, anything you can think of for work or jobs or job interviews. Our kids are in need of that and it's just a great thing and I was so blessed to have that experience and we're blessed to have those people in our district. Lastly, I just wanted to say that, you know, we're entering into a kind of a difficult um, 
difficult next couple of months where we're going to have to make some budget cuts going forward. And we just wanted to assure our public that we're taking it very seriously, both at the board level and then also at the cabinet level. As a matter of fact, the cabinet team and I have met several times and we're going to meet again on Monday and we're taking the hits first um, in the central office and we've already got about six six point nine million dollars. Is that right? Of cuts that we've got. Is that roughly right? Six. Yeah. And then in addition to that, um, we uh, decided um, after talking to the district support team um, that we needed to maybe go back and um, try to make those cuts a little bit deeper so we can keep them as much as we can away from the campuses and the programs in the district. Um, and it's it's kind of interesting. You, you got we got all this feedback online. Um, and of course, they want to cut the superintendent, which, by the way, is not legal. So um, also, my wife might have something to say about that. Um, but uh, also just, you know, there was a number of things about administration, but I will tell you, I've only in the, been in the district for three months and we're a pretty lean district. I asked uh, Karen to actually contact the agency, Texas Education Agency, and find out where we were in terms, terms of our administrative cost ratio. And we're consistently one of the five. Um, Correct, one of the five uh, lowest administrative cost ratios out of over a thousand districts. In the state of Texas. Yes, sir. So we're gonna do everything we can to take as much of that hit as possible, but um, with a hundred and roughly a hundred and thirty million dollars of deficit, um, and we've got about a billion one budget, billion two budget, um, there's not much there. There's only about 1.8% administration at the central office, and then there's a couple percentage at the um, at the campuses. But um, assistant principals and principals do yeoman's work, and so we know that's going to be difficult to get there. And so um, we're worried that it's going to go deeper than we had hoped. We're going to only going to do about a third of it, but we have a fund balance that we're going to probably dip into a little bit to try to smooth our budget over and then hope also that the legislature will come to our rescue. But to uh, kick it off, um, since I'm new here um, and we, we want to do raises for our staff too, um, if we do a raise for myself, um, I'm going to just say that I'm going to donate that raise back to the school district to take the first hit in the school district. So um, there you go. So we're, we'll do everything we can to keep it away from our, our kids and our, our staff members. So, but thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to you. And now for recognitions. I would ask if you could please, uh, you know, go, go down, Todd and uh, Christine, go down forward. We're gonna announce our, uh, bring out the best awards from the board. Uh, there's two individuals we like to represent in the community. They're picked by uh, their peers uh, they cannot be a supervisor, but they can be either be a teacher or a non-teacher position. Our first one is Lakeisha Jones. Lakeisha, are you here? Awesome. <laughs> Lakeisha Jones is the uh, head custodian at the Brodigan Center, which I got to visit this week, got to meet her myself. And we like to truly, ce truly, truly um, celebrate someone who's truly exceptional. Her dedication to students is unparalleled. Whether they're facing challenges or celebrating successes, she's there, offering support and encouragement. She inspires them with their full potential, guiding them by, through compassion and wisdom. What sets her apart is the ability to instill in respect for students, making them not only listen, but also learn. She embodies the essence of excellence in education, a true asset to our campus, and the shining example for all. Please join me in congratulating her for outstanding contributions to our school community, and thank you for being an inspiration to us all. And we'll get a picture when we get done with everybody else okay. at the break. Oh, want to do it now? Yeah, we'll do the break. We'll do it the whole board. Okay. Our next one is Megan Costello. Megan, you here? Awesome. <laughs> Megan is a teacher at Cypress Lakes High School. And it says, my absolute pleasure to present an award to someone whose dedication and commitment have truly made a difference in our community. Ms. Costello embodies the very essence of what it means to bring out the best in others. Her unwavering dedication to our students extends beyond the confounds of our classroom. 
would ever bring out the best lesson conducted during the advisory period, she ignites a spark of inspiration with her students, guiding them towards their full potential. But her impact doesn't stop there. Ms. Costello's compassion knows no bounds, whether it's in the hallways, interacting with students and staff, fostering a safe environment, free in her classes, she constantly demonstrates concern for the common good. Reliable, generous, and compassionate. These are qualities, qualities that define her. She embodies a spirit of service and selflessness, and tonight we celebrate her remarkable contributions to our community. Congratulations to you. Thank you. And uh, Natalie and Justin, if y'all can step down, we're going to have now uh, Dr. Macias is going to do the 2023 National Board Certified Teachers. Uh, yeah, go down there. Thank you, Mr. Hendry. And actually, Dr. Gorey is going to handle this agenda item. Thank you. Good evening, President Henry, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Killian. The National Board Certification is the most respected professional certification available in education and provides numerous benefits for teachers, students, and schools. Recognized as the gold standard in teacher certification, the National Board believes higher standards for teachers equals better learning for students. It was designed to develop, retain, and recognize accomplished teachers and to generate ongoing improvement in schools nationwide. With the National Board Certification becoming part of the Teacher Incentive Allotment, many regional service centers offer a fee-based cohort opportunity. In 2021, Cypress Fairbanks elected to start a free cohort for in-district teachers wanting to seek National Board Certification in one year. By National Board standards, candidates can work towards certification, completing the first attempt of all four components in as little as one year or up to three years. Two retake opportunities provide a five-year window to achieve certification. While it is entirely possible for candidates to achieve certification on their own, membership in the cohort undoubtedly aids in the journey. The cohort process is rigorous, as the candidates can attest to. It requires many hours of dedicated time, but ultimately it is, is, it is rewarding. One of the main characteristics of the cohort is to provide a forum through which candidates can find peer support, mentorship, guidance, and guidance from current National Board Certified Teachers. If there are any nas current National Board Certified Teachers in the audience, will you please stand to be recognized? At the start of our cohort in 2021, there were only three national certified teachers. That's Marianne Dirsch, Perla Vega, and Angela Guy. And these three teachers serve as facilitators for the SciFair cohort. Upon being awarded certification, many of the newly certified national board teachers immediately became a resource by serving as mentors to our candidates who are in cohort three that is currently underway. As a point of reference, because I know we like points of reference um, with information about surrounding districts, SciFair had 11 teachers certified in 2023. Tom Ball had three teachers certified. Katie and Houston each had two teachers become certified. Spring, Spring Branch, and Klein did not have any teachers certified in 2023. So we are excited to continue to offer this cohort opportunity. I am pleased to introduce the 11 newly certified teachers, bringing our total in Cypress Fairbanks ISD to 24 National Board Certified Teachers. <laughs> These 11 teachers earned certification on December 9, 2023. Nine of them as part of the second SciFair cohort and two earned their certification independently. Our first teacher is Lauren Anderson from Cypress Woods High School, certified in career and technical education. Lisa Onienko from Truett Middle School, certified in music. Daniel Bond Cable from Cypress, Cypress Lakes High School, certified in English as a new language. Melissa Breeden Craven from Renell Elementary, certified as a generalist. Anna Byrne, who's not with us tonight, certified in English, I'm sorry, in a special needs, in exceptional needs specialist from Cypress Ridge High School. Oh wait, she's here, Tanya, she's here. Hi, Dr. Gordon. 
she didn't sit in her assigned seat. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany Cross from Cypress Woods High School, Social Studies History Certification. <laughs> Alma Gallagher from Andre Elementary, certified as English as a New Language. Hannah Hinsdale from Goodson Middle School, certified in music. Tanya McKelvey, District Reading Transition Specialist, certified in literacy, reading, language arts. Allison Vergara from Brosnahan Elementary, certified in literacy, reading, language arts. Anne Rowena Ward from Campbell Middle School, certified in Literacy, Reading, Language Arts. We understand that it takes a strong support system to accomplish this task. So will the families and campus supporters please stand to be recognized as well. Thank you. Congratulations. The board will now recognize National Qualifiers Gold Award recipients and Silver recipients for the 40th Annual Teach Tomorrow Summit. And uh, Lucas and Julie, if you all would come down forward for those. President Henry, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Killian, it is a pleasure to present to you this evening the first and second place winners, top five winners in the state, and national qualifiers from the Texas Association of Future Educators TAFI 40th Annual Teach Tomorrow Summit, held in Round Rock, Texas on February 28th through March the 1st, 2024. Several of these students were able to join us tonight. Students, please come up when I call your names. From Bridgeland High School, the teacher is Stacy Morgan. National qualifiers will advance to national competition in Washington, D.C. this summer. The students are Andrea Sanchez, <laughs> Madeline Smith, Sanjana Yaraparetti, Kaylee Hansen, Lauren Womack, Tiana Reed, Croston Rice, Ashley Trapp. The first and second place winners are, and some of these students have won multiple awards. So first and second place, Anaya Thibodeau, Ellie Horton, Audrey Watsky, Kenley Thomas, Allison Murbach, Sophie Price, Audrey Watsky should have another certificate there, and as well as Kenley Thomas. Carolyn Washnog, <laughs> Croston Rice, <laughs> Ashley Trapp, and Victoria Foster. 
So some of these students won the gold award and the silver award, so they're getting multiple certificates. We have talented students. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. So the Sci Fair High School, the teacher is Crystal Stevenson. The national qualifiers are Samantha Torres. The top five in the state designation means that there are only five students in the state total making this, not 5%, it's five people. Making top five in the state is Marissa Zapata. And I believe she was not able to make it. I'm sorry about that. All right, first and second place winners are Corinne Teak. <laughs> Madison Crownover. <laughs> Madison Morris. <laughs> Candice Banda. <laughs> Kylie Mock. Candace Banda got another certificate, and Kylie Mott got a second certificate. Thank you. From Cypress Creek High School, the teacher is Christina Bramwell. The national qualifiers are Emma Lee, Marcus Robinson, Natasha Fry and Joshua Osborne. The first and second place winners are Devin Trombetta and Marcus Robinson. And Marcus, you have a second certificate up here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ana E. Vasquez. Tanya Diaz, Alexandra Carter. The national qualifiers from Jersey Village High School are not able to be here tonight. Those students are Ariel Blaylock and Lily Sailors, and the teacher is Dr. Liz Starr. Could we have all the groups come back up for a large group picture, please? While they're coming up, I'd like to say thank you that these students aspire to become educators, and they're competing in events that are directly related thank you, to their intended future professions. They are to be congratulated for their fine work, and we hope they will come back to work for Cypress Fairbanks ISD. And again, these are state winners. As we congratulate these fine students from Bridgeland, Cypress Creek, Cypress Fair, and Jersey Village High School would like their parents, friends, administrators, and teachers to please stand and be recognized. Thank you, you may leave. And I, I just wanna say, these are a great group of kids, great group of teachers, and it takes the families and the teachers to support them, and we appreciate it. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to rearrange the agenda by moving up agenda item 7C, and we'll be voting on this item at this time. 
7C, the board considered administration's recommendations for naming to elementary school number 59. Dr. Killian, do you have a recommendation? Uh, it is my pleasure to recommend to you Ollie Mae Bird as the namesake for elementary number 59. Ms. Bird taught for 30 years all in Cypress Fairbanks ISD. Originally from Crockett, Texas, she began her career as an elementary teacher at Carverdale School in 1957. When Carverdale closed in uh, 1970, she transferred to Holbrook Elementary School where she served as a second grade math teacher until her retirement in 1987. Former students remember her as a teacher who inspired and challenged them to reach their full potential. One former student recalled her often uh, repeating the words, you are smart enough to become anything in life, you so choose, the sky's the limit. Ms. Bird was named Teacher of the Year while at Hallbrook. Upon her retirement, a new, uh, new wing at Hallbrook was named in her honor known as the Bird Wing. The wing at Hallbrook is, no longer exists, but her legacy does. Ms. Bird earned her bachelor's degree in education from Prairie View A&M University in 1951, followed by her master's in 1963. Not only was she dedicated to improving the lives of her students, but she also became an active member of the Metropolitan CME Church and the Shepherd Park Terrace community where she lived. She left a la lasting legacy of growing current and future educators. At Carverdale, she led the teacher corps and helping fellow educators work towards earning graduate degrees. Her daughter, Mary Lilly, um, has taught for nearly 40 years and currently serves as a reading teacher at ALC East. Elementary number 59 will be located at, located at 20002 West Road in the uh, uh, Mira Mesa community and is set to open in 24-25 school year. It is my pleasure to, and my honor to recommend her. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the naming of elementary school number 59 to Ollie Mae Bird Elementary School. May I have a second? Mr. President, I second. Any questions on discussion? Seeing none, we'll now take a vote. Please signify by raising your right hand. Holly, it's a 7-0 vote. Congratulations. At this time, we're going to take a break, but if I could ask uh, Megan and Lakeisha to please come up forward. We'll take a picture real quickly, and also we'll take a picture with Bart as well. But a five-minute break. Thank you.
we're going to start in two minutes. If you'd like to leave, you're welcome to leave <laughs> with the regular board. Before we proceed with board comments, I see that we have an elected official with us. Mr. Hickman, do you have anything to add? Button. All right. I usually get to sit up in uh, one of those fancy chairs, not, not down here. Um, Superintendent Kelly and Cypher staff, uh, President Henry and trustees, great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Wanted to give you a quick update on what we are doing in Austin with the State Board of Education. I'll be there next week. I've been here in front of this board a few times, but we now have a new superintendent, a new building, beautiful facility, so probably tells you about how long it's been since I've been here. Um, just personally, my wife's an alum of Jersey Village, and I've got a nephew uh, in Cy Fair. I've got two kids in Spring Branch schools and one daughter off in college. Um, Start quickly with library policies, a hot button issue, HB 900. Uh, the governor had sent a letter to the state board and others asking us to look into this. A secret of the state board is we can only do what the legislature tells us to do. Uh, so we needed governor, uh, sorry, Jared Patterson and HB 900. I worked with uh, my old friend Martha Wong. She was a state rep. She's now chair of TSLAC. Uh, they came up with an original draft I did some drafting behind the scenes, made some comments. TSLAC adopted that, State Board adopted that. So that uh, TSLAC library policy is now in effect. And what that says, I think, is directs uh, each school district, each municipal library, uh, other libraries, kind of how to adopt your local policy. Um, moving on, I see you're adopting some science and CTE materials tonight. Uh, talk quickly about HB 1605. That's, um, I tried to tell the commissioner, make it RAIM, R-A-I-M. He didn't like that. It, they call it IMRA, Instructional Material Review and Adoption. We adopted at the State Board a quality and a suitability rubric. Uh, the quality rubric we're first doing is English language arts, Spanish language arts, and math for this first cycle. Now TEA is going out for an RFP process to all the publishers asking for uh, materials that would be uh, meeting one of those 
subjects. And we, at this point, we need reviewers. So if there's educators, experts, parents with an expertise, community members with an expertise uh, for one of those subject areas, what's gonna happen over the summer is all those materials we reviewed in line with the rubrics uh, generate a bunch of reports that will come back to the state board and we will adopt those materials. The difference now with 1605 versus the old world is we would adopt materials and you could adopt them or you could adopt anything else for SciFair. Now if you adopt these materials under 1605, the high quality, I think it's an extra $40 per kid. So they're putting a carrot out uh, to adopt the state board adopted materials under 1605, but you're waiting for us to adopt some materials so that you can then adopt them and get your hands on that money. Um, but that money's building up in escrow. You're not losing anything right now. Uh, it's building up and when you adopt, or if you adopt, uh, up to you in the future, that, that's when that, uh, those funds are unlocked. Um, my colleague, Audrey Young, uh, so I have kind of the southeast part of SciFair. She has a big donut all around Houston, and she has kind of the northwest part of SciFair. Uh, she chairs the, the Committee on Instruction. They're doing some updates on the Dyslexia Handbook. If you have any questions on that, I'll ask Audrey to come and answer them for you. Uh, I completely defer to her. I'm on the um, Committee on School Initiatives, and I'll talk about some of the uh, items I chair that committee. Um, I saw the National Board Certification tonight uh, awards. Uh, there are some items. My committee oversees SBEC, so any SBEC rule changes come to the state board. We have the opportunity to take no action or veto. Uh, Ed TPA, PPR, Texas TPA, uh, if there's any interest in those items, happy to talk about those. Uh, some SBEC rule changes coming up. Another item I'm working on in my committee is uh, kind of increasing the certification standards for people that give you training as school board members. Uh, so the, who, who those people are and what sort of certification they need. Um, another hot button issue, charter approvals. We do that once a year. Those approvals or vetoes will be coming up in June. So applicants have already submitted. Um, we have capacity interviews in May and the ones who make it all the way through the funnel with the commissioner approval, external review, capacity <coughs> review, comes to the state board for the final thumbs up, thumbs down. And that'll be at our June meeting. Um, we have, we, bread and butter of what we do is TEKS. Uh, TEKS for each course are eight to 10 pages, curriculum standards. We have hundreds of CTE courses we're slowly working through. 30 or 40 courses per meeting. Uh, we always need industry experts in any of those areas where we have CTE courses uh, to work on work groups. I don't draft TEKS, we send them out to the experts, the experts draft the TEKS, and they come back to us for kind of final polishing. Uh, school safety training, uh, we have an update. That's the training you receive, that'll be coming to my committee next week uh, for final approval. Um, so if you have any comments, I'd be interested to hear those. And the last thing I'll mention, um, my personal p passion is CCMR, Career College Military Readiness. Statewide, we're at a 60% number. I'm working with a number of different nonprofits, ISDs. We adopted a new course I drafted a couple years ago, trying to get some instructional materials and really have a new course for every seventh and eighth grader to find what, how do they want to start their adult life what do they want to do the day after they graduate high school? Whether that's go be an Aggie or Longhorn, be a pipe fitter, buy a nail salon, and become a Marine or enlist in the Army. Just having a goal for everyone and something they're working towards. And they're working with their counselor to develop the curriculum in high school to get them there. So, uh, President, I'll stop there. Um, happy to talk about anything else or answer any questions or head on home, whatever you like. I know you got a busy yeah, night. No questions, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. We'll now proceed with board comments. The board will make comments during this portion of the agenda regarding schools visited, meetings, conferences attended, district events, et cetera. The board may take no actions on any items discussed. Uh, at this time, I'll take anyone like to speak. Please just signify by asking him if he spoke. Natalie, go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, thank you. I uh, appreciate Mr. Hickman coming to speak. Actually, his, um, his um, comments were a segue to the first part of my board comments tonight, because um, I agree with him that the goal of our schools is to ensure that each student does reach their full potential. Um, and for me, that means foundational skills, character or interpersonal skills, technological skills, and skills for college, career, and beyond. Um, so that they really are college, career, military, or life ready. Um, such that the day after they graduate, just like he mentioned, is a better day than the day before. Um, for some students, life was better the day before graduation, um, when they came to a structured place daily, where they were cared for, had meals available, and really had something they were focused on accomplishing. And so um, as we set our district vision and goals and develop our strategic plan, we should keep in focus that that is our responsibility. It's not just to get them to graduation, but to prepare the young people for the day after graduation. And we're so positioned to do that in this fantastic district. I do believe that we, we do this by ensuring that the voice, choice, and values aligned options are available for every parent and student. Um, we set it as a goal to be every parent's best uh, choice for their child's education, not by default, but by concerted effort to hear from what the people want from our students and our parents and our community, let's voice and match it to their values and then go ahead about creating those choices that are needed if something else is needed. If we focus on this, we will, be, we will continue to be every parent's best choice for their child's education. And that is my focus as a CFISD trustee. I don't fight competition, I beat it. Um, to do this, our first priority, of course, is always safety, um, so that we can do our main job of preparing our students for college, career, and life. Um, outperforming systems build character and focus on core curriculum. This takes an intentional focus on student outcomes. This requires a student outcomes-focused governance model. Um, this requires data to let us know if we're reaching the mark and to empower us to make adjustments real time if we're not. I'm unapologetic about my need for data to do the job that I was elected to do. I appreciate Dr. Macias and her team spending time to really prepare a critical report to help us understand our literacy. Um, we had a mid-year reading report that showed that only 55% of our kindergartners and first and second graders were performing at or above the 50th percentile. That is a 1% improvement over last year. For African-American students, 47% are below the 40th percentile, up from 41% last year. On our STAR ELAR test for the last two years, over 13,000 students in third through 10th grade were not at the approaches level yet. Um, the report completed with my name on it is prior to the creation of our board ASVP committee, looked at current ninth graders who failed STAR in third grade in CFISD and asked the question, how many are still not passing and what impacts that? What factors impact it? Of the 8,000 matched records, uh, 907, of, we found seven, 979 students who were still in our system. Of those who failed in 2017, 2018, each year we made great progress to reduce the number. And by 2022, 2023, we still had 27% of those students um, who had not yet passed the STAR. So that means they didn't pass in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, or eighth grade, 20% of the students. So that is why I asked for the data. We have to be really active in pursuing. Of them, 260, that's 261 students. So I want to commend that in a huge system of our size, the fact that it's 261 students and that we continue to close that gap every year was, uh, was excellent. And, but I would also say, how, what more can we do? That's the question I ask, what more can we do? Of those 261 students, um, we won't be surprised to hear it, but these students were 77% of them were in special education, 61% were English language learners, 28% were economically disadvantaged, and 28% of them were bilingual. Um, we also saw a pattern with higher absences and a number of discipline infractions, and you were more likely to not have passed yet if you're African American or Hispanic. So we need to understand more, more and more frequently, especially the, as the huge pendulum swing has happened in reading instruction at the state level, um, and maybe a potential overcorrection um, for uh, science of teaching reading and phonics, um, which is important, but that focus on skills more than leveled reading could be something that we need to keep our finger on as a school board to make sure that we're not losing um, the progress that we've made, especially after COVID, we must stay vigilant. Um, so, and I am called to be more than a cheerleader, I'm called to be a change maker. Student outcomes don't change unless adult behaviors change. We have to know where we are, where we're going, based on a continuous diet of data. Each child is counting on me, on us to do this. On that note, I have, there are such an incredible campus teams that are out doing this work every day. Um, have, I've had the, uh, truly a privilege, the highlight of, maybe naming a school today was one of them, but the highlight is to get to visit campuses and see the outstanding work, some faces in this room of those people. And I would just like to highlight a few of um, 
a, a, just a comment about each place that I visited because we have incredible people who genuinely care about our students and take pride in their campuses. And I also want to say that they're just beautiful, vibrant, high, well-maintained facilities. So I want to congratulate all the teams that helped that happen. Um, Dr. Lynette Bellamy at Side Lakes. The campus really demonstrates a very student-centered spirit. Students are known and cared for. And there's a really collaborative leadership culture there of doing whatever it takes for, to meet student needs. I also want to shout out to Ms. Cockrell, who asked me to visit her classroom. I happened to see her in Costco the day before. Um, but she let me talk to her math students, and they had a genuine mutual respect for her. Um, and so I just appreciated that. And also the NAC centers at all the campuses. I'll just call it out once. But a little group of students who looked at me and said, we're a team. I said, where are you from? Where are you from? They were five different countries all over the world, and they were just united there in nice, rigorous learning. Duryea creates a staff culture of finding, uh, Tamika Williams there really has a strength in finding and growing teacher talent in a family environment. Um, the teachers demonstrate a strong craft and you could tell that they enjoy teaching their happy little learners. At Sprague Middle School, the students are encouraged in their leadership and they're very proud of their campus and their teachers show great craft in their classroom and, and there's really a humble spirit of service at the campus. At Hairgrove, Hairgrove, Elizabeth, um, uh, is Hairgrove, did I skip one? Oh, Hairgrove, Michelle Lee. I know the campus well. My church has adopted it for years, but what a fine example of instructional leadership. I appreciated the chance to take a deep dive into intentional practices that make that campus such an outperformer. Higher expectations around planning, coupled with support and having the teacher's backs. Um, it equates to teacher retention, exceptional literacy practices, including guaranteed intervention if you're not on level as a reader, and an intentional practice to get there. Several more key levers of success were shown. Cy Ridge, I really want to call out something special they were doing called Bridge Year. As we talk about CCMR and kids really having a plan after high school, um, students there, their CT department and their wonderful principal, Mr. Lozano, um, kids have the opportunity to engage in some hands-on exploration of in Houston economy, high paying, high demand career opportunities um, that require less than a four year degree. And they were able to uh, focus on touching those things and making a plan. And that's a, also another thing about the campus was really um, having some intentional work around small group instruction and their core classrooms to really make sure the students are growing. Um, Cy Springs has such a strong focus. Um, Dr. Henry and Dr. Cheryl Henry really is, um, the student experience is so critical there and ways to engage the students so that they enjoy school and feel like they belong in school. Plus also doing some strong work in their freshman core classes to bring like a workshop approach with small group instruction were, were features. Lowry Elementary, just down the street from me, um, has such a beautiful and intentional campus, uh, had a lot of student voice that was able to be heard and they were very intentional about learning and growing and using data to, um, to drive their campus and a true desire for feedback was seen. At Bang, it's a super focused school. Susan Bolado is a lovely person and she has a really great staff that have, they really focus on their teaching craft. Um, they were thoughtful about literacy and learning and you could see that the English language learners on their campus have very effective instruction and the focus on their interventions also tracking, making sure kids move. Uh, Michael Pagano out of Fraser Elementary, he um, also enjoyed how the students were leaders there, but there's student intentional focus on student progress and goals and making the goals clear for the kids themselves to engage in and to celebrate their own mastery, and then consistency of focus was seen. Today I had the pleasure of being out at ALC East, a strong balance of high expectations and deep care for the students as people. Um, the focus on honoring and supporting the teachers that have chosen um, to be there with a specific heart for their kids. And finally, Campbell Middle School. The climate there has a focus on building character of the students, such great eye contact, truly happy little learners, hugs. And so uh, we could see that they really had, along with their strong instructional practices, a desire to make sure the children understood who they were and that they had confidence and pride in themselves. I want to thank uh, Wilburn for letting me come out for Read Across America, and Will, uh, Ms. Willis out of uh, Wilson for the beauty of Wilson, a wonderful multi cultural parade. And finally, I want to congratulate our um, deaf and hard of hearing team, our special education leadership under, um, we are the district that um, provides services for Spring Branch, Klein, Tomball, and Waller. And we went to an extensive review program under TEA to make sure that we were uh, meeting the standards of the program. And they passed with flying colors, had exceptionally strong areas. And I just want to congratulate that team. And finally, on the topic of parental engagement, I appreciated the presentation we had on Monday night. I challenged our district to gather data and keep pushing for more engagement of parents and their child's education. 
I really would hope we can quantify a baseline of who we're reaching and push to create systems. Um, since 17% of our folks cited in the parental involvement, that parental involvement is a big challenge for CFISD in our Vassily survey in spring of 2022. But mostly I just want to call out, I want to thank our administration team um, with all the great work you've been doing as we prepare for so many difficult decisions. And I just want to thank the, the staff on uh, every campus. It's a tough time of the year as we wind down the year. And I just want to appreciate you staying in there and really pushing for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, thank you, Mr. President. So it's great to see everyone this evening um, as we're in the home stretch to finish up the school year. I think we set a record this evening for awards and recognition. Uh, Scott, that's, in the, that's a record we need to shoot to break at some point. Um, it's been a pretty busy week for trustees and administration. Um, school visits have gotten kicked off, and I'm thoroughly enjoying them. My very first school visit ever, ALC West. Uh, Derek Crowder and Stephanie Coleman are doing a great job over there, um, and their work is emerging in importance. And so it was a, a great learning opportunity and spending time with those guys as well. And I was able, also able to meet with M. Robinson Elementary. I want to thank the principal, uh, Principal Bailey, and uh, Assistant Principal, uh, happy Assistant Principal Week, uh, to Daniela Blair. And so what was interesting about that was I was greeted and met by representatives of the Student Council. The entire tour was conducted by members of the Student Council at M. Robinson Elementary, all future elected leaders. I gave them some help and guidance in that regard. So uh, Becky Coop at Smith Middle School, um, in addition to a great tour, we had a really nice sit down in her office and we just talked about the state of public ed and the state of our schools and she's a tenured leader in this school district and I gathered a tremendous amount of information from her and I really appreciate her feedback and counsel. And also I wanna thank uh, Carmen Lozano, principal at Andre Elementary um, because she, she reached out to us and said, look, I know you're meeting at this time but can you come a little early because we have a, um, an on-hand parent event for uh, a reading event on campus. We'd like for you to be on campus with our parents. And I was able to accommodate and I was happy to do so and to uh, watch a just a, a huge amount of parents descend upon the kindergarten and first grade and they all embraced reading and it was a great, it was a great, um, great sight to see. And it's on a, you know, site, you know, school visits now that we're able to, you know, get, now that we're doing those, it's honestly one of the best parts of being a trustee and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'm looking forward to doing even more. Uh, but it's, you know, there, there are some other things that's kept us quite busy over the last several weeks as well. And we've talked about them, we'll continue to talk about them. It's the board committees, um, including the governance committee, the teacher ad hoc committee, finance and operations. The planning and vision that's coming out of these meetings has been great. Uh, I'm looking forward to the work product that we're gonna put before put before the broader board, and we're gonna put before the public as well. Uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, and uh, we're putting together quite a good work product. I think it's gonna be quite beneficial. Um, I was able to attend the Name That Book event. Congrats to Copeland Elementary. Uh, my daughter, Lauren, competed as well in that. And, you know, after, as I watched them do that, I, rec I realized that, you know, when you send your kids to bed and they're up there and the light's on and they're up late and they're past their bedtime and you have to get on them, all they have to do now is say, I'm reading. And I'm so okay, that's fine, carry on. Stay up as late as you want to. <laughs> and so, uh, great event, great kids. Uh, we had quite a few teams. And uh, the fact that they all had to read, between a team of five people, they had to read 100 books. And the, the, the proctor and the moderator would just, put out a little blurb from the book and they all have to get together and actually uh, name that book. It was amazing. I've done it, I've watched it for a couple of years and it just gets, keeps getting better every single year. Uh, as a member of the International Thespian Society, surprised to hear that, aren't you? Uh, I attended some, uh, I attended the UIL One Act Play competition. Love it, that's my jam. It was great, I enjoyed it. I recommend everybody go to that. Um, and congrats to all of the teams that have advanced and moving on to the next level. Uh, break a leg. Don't say good luck, break a leg. Um, whether it's reading with kids at the Early, Early Learning Center uh, for Read Across America, as well as supporting our superstars at the Salute to Our Stars Banquet, it's, it's busy, it's good busy, and our district is on the move. Um, last week I mentioned that uh, I attended our first meeting of the Budget Reduction Advisory Committee, and I wanna thank everyone's participation for that. Uh, I, in addition to hearing that uh, we should uh, eliminate the superintendent, I also heard that we should <laughs> cut trustee pay, <laughs> which I can get behind 100%, yeah. right? Completely cut it. Um, with all that being said, in all seriousness, all the participants of the Budget Advisory Committee 
are taking this work very, very seriously. Um, and what's really telling about it and so encouraging is that everybody's taking this in a can-do team spirit. I'm not you know, people are not bemoaning the state of our district or bemoaning the state of our state. It's a come together as a community activity to find ways for us all to work collectively together to address these budget challenges. And it's very encouraging and I look forward to continuing to see the recommendations from that committee. And uh, those are my comments this evening, Mr. President. Thank you. Anyone else? Julie? All right. Chris, stay. Um, I was, while I was gone, um, welcoming my third grandbaby uh, this past month, um, I wanted to thank, uh, I was able to take some training, uh, to thank you to Le Leslie Francis and Joel Weckerly for doing social media training. Uh, I also wanted to um, note that I did take um, Education Service Center for orientation to the Texas Education Code and evaluating and improving student outcomes. Um, I was able to uh, attend several events in the um, Last few weeks, the Beauty of Wilson multicultural event was phenomenal. It was amazing from the culture, the dress, the food, loved the food. It was awesome. I uh, highly recommend that you attend those at your local school because the, the campuses that are putting that on have put a lot of work into that. And it is a fabulous presentation of dance um, and of the um, array of food and the um, history and culture of each of those uh, countries that they come from so it was it was fabulous um, I also had some school visits myself I did go to the Carpenter Center the Cardinals uh, principal Solana Singh um, that is a that is a challenging campus that helps ch students from uh, somebody that's having anxiety to um, having GT, uh, but they have some issues there that they need support with. And so um, she has done a fantastic job of moving from punitive to therapeutic to incorporate the families into that culture and to create cardinal pride there. And it has been such a joy uh, to visit time with them. They have a garden, um, so I'm going to go back and help with that because uh, I love gardening. And then I also visited with Hamilton Elementary. Principal Sage Papia Anu. Um, it was very sweet. I had a, a welcome banner when I got there, and the student council, Stuco, uh, took me around and, and gave me the tour of inside and outside of that campus. Um, they were just um, fabulous. They actually also partner with Holbrook on some of the needs that they have throughout the year. So super proud of Hamilton for reaching out and making a difference. Um, they do have an adoption partner at that school, and we've talked about that a lot. All of our campuses would love to be adopted, so if you're a business or a nonprofit, we would love for you to be a part of SciFair and adopt a campus and make a difference uh, to those teachers and students. I also had an opportunity to visit with Bain Elementary, B-A-N-E Bain, uh, Principal Cesar Diaz, who's going to be going to Owens shortly. Um, it was a wonderful visit. That campus has been redone. It is gorgeous. If you have not had a chance to be there on the east side of the district, it is a stunning campus. Um, the uh, parents are very supportive. Um, and they love the campus, they love the teachers, and they um, have a safe and nurturing environment to give those kids a chance to be successful. So um, I really appreciated visiting with him as well. Uh, they had a beautiful library. If you've never been in that library, it's cylindrical, and you can talk in the middle, and it, your voice reverberates throughout it. So it's a really cool place. So go by Bain if you haven't been there. I also met with uh, Gleason Elementary, Christine Melanson, um, she's striving to create a culture of excellence, uh, strong relationships, student leaders, uh, promoting a growth mindset. Um, they are working uh, with their parents and they're taking on a proactive approach in their school. Uh, then I also had an opportunity to meet with Joel Elementary Principal Kimberly Criswell and they have created lots of opportunities for parents to come and be a part of the school um, from skate night um, to Jaguar leaders and experiences. They're really trying to individually award their students with the hard work that they're doing day in and day out. They're diving deep into data. They had a whole wall of data uh, for their reading and their math scores and, and how they're trying to approve, improve that. So that was super impressive. Um, and I got to uh, go next door to Hoover Elementary, met Dr. Rice, Dr. Michelle Rice, she's here tonight, um, with uh, Hoover's Heroes. Um, they are amazing. Uh, they have the pre-K through third grade. 
I'm sorry, through second grade, um, and they are uh, working, they have several programs, bilingual SPED, ESL, and GT. Um, they plan together and they work hard together. They are definitely into data digging as well. Um, they collaborate together and with their culture, um, she puts people and, and students together to make things happen. Uh, they've really uh, worked also to try to increase community engagement and she believes that building rapport and creating those relationships that will bless the students makes the biggest difference. Um, I went to also to McGowan to uh, see Principal no Laura Novosinski, and I was again uh, treated to a, a, a tour by some students, uh, the Owls, and they're owl amazing. Very cool school. They like sparking joy. They like creating experiences. Uh, students are leaders, and they've worked really hard to form great relationships with parents. Some of the schools in the district um, take on that 212 mentality, so you'll hear that throughout the district. Um, they try to model and be better, and they also um, love to um, also, uh, she said to model, and then she uh, so appreciates her staff as well, she said. Um, Frank Cohn, I met with uh, Principal Melissa Martin, and they are working so hard to give high quality instruction. They're trying to get it right the first time. They're helping their teachers. They're um, teaching their students to soar. They're very invested in student outcomes and they're making a difference. And in fact, they, they are getting feedback from parents and grandparents who say that they so appreciate the, the model that they are. Um, for middle school, I actually got to visit with Aragon, and my, student, my children went to Aragon, so that was near and dear to my heart. And Principal Dirk Heath, actually, him and I are alumni from Sci Fair, class of 85 at Sci Fair. Uh, Bobcat fight never dies. Uh, so he just talked about how they have such a pride in, the, in school, they have community involvement, they've got a commitment to the kids from the teachers and fostering those relationships. Um, they're looking forward to uh, retaining their staff and training through those challenges and working smarter, not harder. Um, and then my last visit was at Langham Creek High School where my daughter attended and she's class of 2006, and so I got to meet with Dr. Jose Martinez, and we had a great visit, and then he took me up to the library where they actually had a career in technology fair. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, they had welding, electrical, plumbing, uh, court reporting, all these different opportunities for the students to come through and participate and uh, take a tour and to engage, uh, and the military as well, to engage in these different areas that if they are not college bound, they have an opportunity to see where will they land after high school. Uh, so that was a, a fabulous experience and I took all their information. I'm going to be posting that later. I've got lots of posting to do online to, ca to catch up. Uh, but I wanted to say it's just been amazing and uh, so enjoyable to meet so many people in the district. And you can tell at every campus, our, our administration and our staff absolutely care. Our teachers care about the students and want to improve. And the students love being there. They ha we're having so much fun. So thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Julie. Lucas. <coughs> Thank you, I'll be brief. Um, so I wanted to give a couple of shout outs. I had the privilege, and I do mean sincere privilege, of visiting Sheridan Elementary School and Walker Elementary School. So um, in my time in my, our schools is my favorite thing by far. <clears throat> so first to Sheridan, so Principal Renee McIntyre, you have an amazing team. Thank you for opening up your school to me and allowing me to visit with your team. And Assistant Principal Jessica John, I have to tell you, when I went to the school, I met Assistant Principal Jessica John, and then I met her instructional coaches. And so I'm going to go through the names, Jennifer Garland, Tegan, and I don't want to slaughter, slaughter this, so forgive me if I do, Tegan Og, Og, I can't even, yes, Tegan, and Tracy Ferguson and Selma Ariaza. We had the best time. <clears throat> so insightful, and we spent time in their, in, uh, in their planning room, and I loved it because that's where the work is done, in part. And the, the work that we did, we understood, they, they helped me to see the world through their eyes, they helped me to understand the 
challenges that they work through in helping early career teachers, teachers that are having, uh, you know, want some additional help in the classroom, the types of the impacts of the decisions that we make here, how it impacts their teachers in the classroom and how we can really help. So I just wanted to state to my Sheridan team that I heard you and thank you for your time very much. And then Walker Elementary School, so Principal Kim Demeron. Uh, so we spent time together and we started talking and we spent the whole hour there in her office working through questions, how to think about certain topics, her giving me her perspective on um, how the staff and the balance of the staff needs to fit the, the needs of the community and what to think about as we go through our coming budget cuts. My time with her, we, we, the time flew by. And whenever a board member visits a school, there's always the obligatory photo. Both of us forgot. I had to leave. Both of us forgot. And, uh, but that's because we enjoyed our time together so much. And so thank you very much, Principal Dameron, for our time together. Uh, it was really wonderful to get to meet you and spend time in your campus. It was awesome. And so, like Christine, I, this past month, I attended the uh, uh, Region 4 board training on improving student outcomes, so that's always great. And we worked, you know, to Justin's point, there's so much happening right now. <clears throat> and so we met with the, you know, on the, our operations and finance committee to plan for the budgetary Reduction Advisory Committee and how to help them and how to support them. So I'll have more comments on that later. But I was able to attend one of our meetings for the budgetary, uh, the Budget Reduction Advisory Committee. And as Justin said, the, the, uh, our committee members, principals, teachers, parents, community members, thank you very much for your time. They handled the discussion with the seriousness it deserved. They were thoughtful. They worked hard, it was divided into individual topics. You'll hear about how that was done. But they all were asked for their extra time to give consideration to help the district, and they gave it. And they continue to give it right now. Thank you very much to all of our administration who's working with that group and to that group themselves. And lastly, an event that's, always, that's coming up this Saturday <coughs> at Cy Ranch, we're going to have a rather large indoor drumline competition. So if anybody likes to hear things that are very loud and go boom, um, <clears throat> it's gonna be a great time. So we have a, a fun fact that not many people know in the district. In the world of indoor drumline, there are, there's levels and hierarchies. And the people compete at different classifications. At the world competition level, that's the highest classification possible. SciFair has three schools in our district that compete at that level. Aside from California, there isn't another state, I think, that can say that about any district in the state. I may be wrong about that, but I don't think I am. And so, shout out, SciFair, Ridgeland, Sci Park, All three competing at the optimum level for indoor drumline competition, and I am so proud of the work that those kids are doing. It is incredible. And I have to get out to Cy Park to see those guys in their facility rather than just a competition. I'm going to make that happen. But I can't wait to see them this coming Saturday. So for all those that enjoy those types of things, come on out. It's going to be a great time. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Go ahead, Jilly. Great. Uh, so since the last meeting, I also made school visits to Spillane Middle School, um, the Carlton Center, Jersey Village High School, and Reed Elementary. Um, just as my colleagues have shared, visiting our campuses are a great way for us to understand the culture of the campus, um, to see the work in action. Um, and I have to say, I'm just so pleased to hear um, my colleagues having such positive experiences and really um, understanding, getting those opportunities and investing that time and energy into understanding what happens on our campuses and building those positive relationships, especially with campus leaders. So um, I thank you for making that investment. It, it, 
it does help us, it helps inform our decisions. Um, we make better decisions when we understand what's happening in, on our campuses. So um, I'm really pleased by that. Um, school events, uh, I also um, participate in Read Across America. I was able to read um, with Wilburn Elementary, Alt Elementary, um, and one of the early learning centers. Um, I attended the uh, annual rodeo roundup at Feast Elementary School, Safari to Success at Lampkin Elementary School, and Multicultural Night at Owens Elementary. Um, just as Christine said, when you, when you get to um, experience a multicultural night at one of our campuses, um, it's a great way just to really um, embrace and celebrate the diversity of our campuses. Um, students and their families come and they share their culture, their food, which is always amazing, <laughs> dance, music, um, uh, but it really helps give you that hands-on experience mm -hmm. um, of how incredibly rich and diverse our district is. It's truly something to be celebrated. I attended uh, district meetings, the District-Wide Educational Improvement Council, the student, Superintendent Student Leadership Advisory Committee, and the um, uh, CLC, Community Leadership Council. Um, district events, obviously, salute to our stars, honoring our teachers and paras of the year, and then my weekly mentoring at Sci Falls and Sci Park. Um, I was... Uh, 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 truly had the honor to attend the memorial service for Lieutenant Jimmy Banks, who was one of the original members of our sci -Fair Police Department. Um, he um, passed away recently, and he was truly a much-loved and respected role model for um, servant leadership. Um, lastly, I just want to close with a couple of things. One, um, it's, uh, it is a very busy time of year, and we're entering testing season, which I know it feels like we're always in testing season, but now it's really, really testing season. So, right. So I uh, just want you all to know that our teachers and um, staff to know that um, we know that our students are more than just a test score. Um, we know you pour into them, and you're, do, you're giving them all the tools and resources they need to be successful, and, and I have no doubt that they will be. Um, but know that we see you, and we see all your hard work, and uh, we are, and our district is much more than just um, a grade given by a state agency. So we appreciate all that you do. Um, and lastly, it is uh, National Librarian Day, so huge shout out to our librarians. You are true educators, professionals, highly educated, who create and nurture a love of reading and, and teaching resources to all of our students from pre-K to 12th grade. So know that you are respected and you are loved. Um, I'm very proud of all the good work happening across our district. So, thank you. Thank you. Todd? All right, uh, I was able, since the last board meeting, I was able to meet with the Andre ELC, and as Leslie Francis and Teresa Hull um, let me know, uh, those are our littlest learners, not little people, they're our littlest learners in, in the school district, and uh, had, had an awesome time reading to the, to, to the kids. They were really in, uh, excited to, you know, obviously have a, have a board member there to, to, uh, to, to read to them. We had a book that we discussed, uh, Farm Animals, and just so everyone knows and everyone's clear, there, um, there was a vote at the end on who the favorite animal was, and the least favorite was giraffe. So the favorite, just proving that these kids live in Texas, was the horse. <laughs> so just wanted you guys to let, uh, let you know that. Erica Ainsworth uh, had an awesome conversation with her. She does a great job. Uh, at the facility, and um, I just wanted to tell her thank you for the hospitality that she showed, and and the um, the, the the folks that she has on staff were, were truly amazing with the kids. While I'm on that subject, Matt, there's a driveway challenge issue that they have, and I was wanting to touch base with you on pick up and drop off. They're having some issues, so so just get get right on that. Uh, in addition to that, baseball season is underway. I got to, I, I got to watch five baseball teams in action from, Cy, uh, from the CFISD. Uh, we got Cy Park. We had Cy Springs, Bridgeland High School. That is a stacked ball club. Uh, Cy Ranch as well. Cy Lakes, um, uh, phenomenal uh, teams, great talent. I appreciate the coaches, the hard work that they put in. They're, they're practicing, I, I would assume, 15 hours plus per week, and um, the time that they really invest in it. I want everyone to under, understand that the viewing, viewing, viewing audience, these, 
these are also educators. Um, these, these folks uh, pour their time, energy, and effort into developing uh, these, uh, you know, for, for baseball, young men, and for the softball teams, uh, young women, and, and to really focus on uh, building the character and, um, you know, it's in, in hopes that, that these folks can uh, develop into to good citizens later on down the road. So I wanted to give a shout out and, and also even an, a little bit of an update as a, as a kudos to some of the, some of the pitchers. So, um, last Friday night, Cy Park was playing um, Cy Ranch, High, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Cy Ranch High School. And two kids I know, uh, David Sandoval pitched, a, he had a one hitter going into the seventh inning, which is the last inning. And uh, Marshall Forsyth also had a one hitter going. And uh, at, the, at, at the top of the top of the seventh inning, there was a, a gentleman by the name, uh, one of our seniors, Jackson Priest uh, at Cy Ranch, hit a bomb. So uh, and it ended up, so it was a heartbreaker for Cy Park. They ended up winning three nothing, but I want to give a shout out to all those kids uh, for, for the uh, phenomenal performance that they had. In addition to that, Cy Creek High School, I, I will be, I will be visiting tomorrow morning um, Sprague Middle School, um, thank you for the short, the sh the being able to have short notice. I'm going to be meeting with them as well because I, uh, Blyle Elementary had something come up and they, they, they wanted to reschedule. Um, I will be visiting Side Creek High School, Sprague Middle School, Adam, uh, Adam Elementary School, Danish Elementary School, Rowe Middle School, Hemingway M Elementary School, Carl the Carlton Center, and Wells Elementary School before the next, um, the, the next board meeting. Wanted to also give an update for the policy committee, we will be uh, meeting at, uh, Marty, is it uh, the, the librarians meeting with uh, the library materials committee reconvening? We will have a new library policy coming out very, very soon. And I also wanted to let everyone know that we will be discussing a cell phone policy very, very soon for the school district. And I wanted to get, get feedback from community members, teachers, and whatever. So Marty, surprise. So, <laughs> so that's it for for uh, for this edition. So, thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Todd. Uh, I'll be brief uh, to save my voice for the rest of the meeting. Uh, it's been a very uh, busy time with between meetings. I want to personally thank the staff and students that generously gave up their time to show off the schools for my visits as well. Uh, I want to thank all the trustees. Uh, for, their, for their diligence and time. As you can hear from all of them, they spend different time in different areas of their own interest. Uh, but they commit many, many, many hours each week uh, to the district. And uh, I want to thank them personally for all that. Sorry to interrupt. Assistant principals, we, we, we have a ton of great assistant principals across the school district. I, needed, I wanted to mention that as well, sorry. Thank you, Todd, for the record. <laughs> to Kenny, you on, on, I honestly pray for each one of you every day, hoping that together we can make a sound decisions for our district. As a United Team of Eight, uh, we, we are entrusted with the welfare of our district. We've already had some great successes, and I'm confident that we will continue to stay strong, but also never feeling alone in our endeavors. With that, we'll now continue on with uh, citizen participation. Portion of the agenda, and I'd like to turn it over to our board secretary, Justin Ray, to continue, please. Per BED local, patrons may address the board during the regular board meeting under citizen participation on any matters of interest or concerns that are not posted agenda items. Individuals may only register to speak one time per meeting and must register in advance. Just a reminder, patrons who have registered to speak this evening may see the order of the names listed on the screen behind me. Before your name is called, please move forward and sit on the two reserved seats on the front row. Our first speaker this evening is Jennifer Chenette. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I like to connect the dots. I attended two out of three community events hosted by Bethany Scanlon, where sitting board members answered questions. At the first one at the Weekly Center, a man purposely moved from the back of the room to the row I was sitting in. He then proceeded to verbally harass two of my friends that he had never met before. It's pretty clear that he was told to do so. The second meeting was at Spring Creek Barbecue. That man was back, sitting at the sign-in table with a smirk on his face. I introduced myself to him at the end of the meeting. He gave me a fake name. He had a little backpack that didn't leave his side, even when he went to the bathroom. We assumed he was carrying weapons. Prior to the third meeting, back at the Weekly Center, I contacted the center to ask about rules regarding weapons. 
Bethany found out and rescinded my invitation while using a threatening tone. I was banned from attending a community event related to our local school board by the wife of a sitting board member because I had concerns about my safety. This man appears to be a bodyguard slash bouncer for Bethany and her crew, which includes Lucas, Natalie, Scott, and Todd. Imagine my surprise when I recently found out that Natalie has been spending an awful lot of personal time with this man. This man has a long arrest record in multiple states. Failure to appear in court, contempt of court, disorderly conduct, assaulting a family member, and impeding their breath. That means choking them. And if my research is accurate, it looks like he was arrested in July in California for possession of a silencer. He spoke at the state level last April about chaplains with Natalie and others, and he talked about how he works with kids. I know that Christian values are near and dear to the heart of Natalie and the rest of the board. Bethany also considers herself a devout Christian, and that is why I find all of this so concerning. This man is being used by board members to bully taxpayers and parents. I don't know what he and Natalie are up to, but it isn't good. The community is watching and paying attention. And Lucas, you can let Bethany know that based on my research, my safety concerns about this man were 100% warranted. And if anything should happen to me or my family, I have a long paper trail. Proverbs 22, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Thank you. And I just found out his last name, so that's why I found out all this information. Paula Arnold. Paula Arnold. Amanda Berry. You have two minutes. I'm so sorry. This is my first time doing this. <laughs> Looks like we're missing a few people. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Amanda Berry, and I'm a community health education specialist with UT Health's uh, Youth Aware of Mental Health Program, otherwise known as YAM. Um, YAM is a universal prevention evidence-based mental health program geared towards 8th through 12th graders at no cost to you and your school district. It is a student-led program that is designed for all students regardless of mental health risk status. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in um, teens age 10 through 24. Um, if the children are our future, then it can't be stressed enough how important mental health education is for this age group. Uh, youth enjoy this program because we create a safe space to discuss topics that are important to them, develop coping skills, and enhance peer empowerment. Since 2016, UT has delivered YAM to over 40,000 students across Texas. We are proudly responsible for over 5,000 of those kiddos here in the Houston area. I've thrown a few numbers at you tonight, but I want to leave you with this statistic. One in six. One in six students in 2019 made a suicide plan. When you think about those students here in Cypher, I want you to remember one in six. Evidence proves that if we can provide YAM to 91 students or three classrooms, it will prevent one new suicide attempt or one new case of severe suicidal ideation, and that's powerful. Based on the number of students who have received YAM here in the Houston area, we have prevented this from happening to 55 students. That is one and a half school buses of our youth still here with us. I am not coming to you as a stranger, but as a, formal, uh, a former Arnold Ladybug a Goodson Grizzly, and a Sidefair Bobcat. I have already met with the Director of Counseling and Guidance, um, so this seemed like the next step. Thank you so much for your time. BFND. Okay. Chris Schweigert. I just, I just want to... Oh, okay. I just want to make sure. Uh, okay. Timer. We're having timer issues right now, but I'm keeping time. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. On March 29th, I attended a community meeting hosted by conservative CFISD and the now defunct Texas Civic Alliance. Trustees Blasingham Scanlon were present and Todd LeComp was the moderator. Before the meeting began, a very tall, bald man came from the back of the room to sit next to my friends and me. This man began speaking to a friend seated next to me. He used abusive language and told my friend she was childish. He continued to insult her throughout the meeting. It got so bad at one point the woman in front of him turned around and asked him to be quiet. During the meeting, the man asked a question about school safety. I offered some information and the man said to me, you are disgusting. I have all of this recorded. My 
then 13-year-old son also attended the meeting. I was shocked to learn the man harassing me and my friends appears to have a close personal relationship with Trustee Blazingame, and he has a criminal record that includes domestic violence. I am frightened imagining if this man actually sat next to my teenager who looks like a grown man. What insults would my 13-year-old be subject to? And after the meeting, after the meeting, I asked Bethany <laughs> over Messenger if she knew who this man was and told her what happened. Bethany disclosed his first name but said we would have to ask his last name, him his last name. There was another meeting held on May 1st. I tried to RSVP but was told by Bethany that I was not welcome because I was disruptive, disruptive at the March meeting. She said members of her group need to feel free from, feel safe from, and free from belittlement. I need to feel safe and free from belittlement. I need my child to be safe and free from harassment at meetings hosted by candidates, the wife of a trustee and attended by school board members. I did not invite this man into my life. He was invited by members of this board and then I was blamed for his presence. At the meeting on May 1st, Tyler Company remarked how much smoother the meeting ran because of the audience. I believe that was in direct reference to me not being in attendance. He should have noted I wasn't available for the goon to harass. I was sitting in the restaurant where the meeting was held. I saw the bald man heading to the bathroom with his backpack. That's time. Please conclude your comments. Thank you. I'm sorry. I thought you would give me a warning like it usually flashes. We were having technical difficulties. I, I was actually keeping manual time, but you got your full two minutes. Thank you. But, and, and it did start flashing red as I was speaking. It's very... It got reset, but yes, I was keeping yeah, time. Yeah, it should be. Thank you. Christina Woods. Good evening. You've just heard some other speakers. This is another parent. There is another parent who was at one of those community meetings they just spoke about. She let Bethany know that she was going to videotape the meeting. Not long after that, this same man approached her and got in her face and even walked a circle around her like a lion preparing to attack its prey. Just exactly what is going on with board members and their associates. Many of you act like you care about children, safety, and scary outsiders, but clearly you don't, or that man, man wouldn't have been coached and then sent to harass a mom sitting next to her junior high age son, and then the friend sitting next to her, and then a woman by herself. It's a, great, it's a great way to try to deter people from speaking out, but you know what? It just fires up people. You will not silence us. We have board members who have blocked stakeholders from their social media accounts. We even have Julie Pickren, who is on the State Board of Education, hiding people's comments if they don't agree with her. What country are we living in? Is this the example we want to set for our children and for the students of Cypher ISD? Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes the citizen participation program of the agenda. Thank you. We will now proceed with item 5A of the reports portion of the agenda. Items 5B and 5C will present the board work session on Monday evening. 5A administration will provide a report on the Cypress Fairbanks and Independent School District demographic update completed by Population and Survey Analysis PASA. Teresa Hull and for speakers. Good evening, Dr. Killian, President Henry, Board of Trustees, and members of the Cabinet. Tonight we're excited to hear from Population and Survey Analysis, better known as PASA. For over 40 years, PASA has served Texas public school districts by providing vital information through demographic studies, student enrollment projections, long-range facility planning, bond election planning, geographical mapping, and data analysis are some of the things that they are experts at. PASA is widely recognized as the leading expert in demographic analysis across Texas. CFISD has enjoyed a collaboration with PASA since 2013, and thanks to this partnership, our boundaries projections and planning team of Laura Lawless and Chris Henning has been exceptional in producing district enrollment projections at an accuracy rate exceeding 99%. To offer a precise figure from 23-24, our boundary projection planning team was able to predict the district snapshot enrollment to within one-tenth of 1% 1 for a 99.9% .9 accuracy rate. Tonight, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Stacy Tapera, president of PASA, and Tiffany Thomas Rogers, Director of Operations, as they present a brief overview of the findings from our most recent demographic study. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be back uh, and see some new faces. 
So this is our 12th demographic study uh, to present to uh, CIFAIR ISD, and we appreciate the longstanding relationship that Scott mentioned, collaborative and cooperative with, um, with the boundaries projections and, and planning uh, department specifically. And this partnership is, has born, been born from great communication and teamwork between the two of us because this really is a, a team project. And it's yielded, as Scott mentioned, highly accurate data that is used widely throughout the district by uh, several different committees, I mean, departments, excuse me. Um, advance the slides, this, got it. Okay, so let's jump in. Uh, well, let's start with some demographic trends um, of the school district. This represents the enrollment over the past uh, 10 years or so in CIFAIR ISD. And so as you can see, in the early years of the decade, 13, uh, 14, et cetera, uh, there, were, there was high growth that, that was happening that has now begun to level off in the past few years. And that's happening for a, a number of reasons, one of which uh, there just isn't as much of developable land left in this district. The district is nearing build out. And so um, that, is, that contributes. And also uh, the, uh, the birth rate uh, that's happening to mothers w living within CIFAIR ISD uh, boundaries. So the maroon line that you see is the number of births happened uh, in the past to mothers within, living within the district. And that is uh, adjusted five years to line up with the kindergarten enrollment five years later in the district. So as you can see, over the past decade or so, enrollment, I mean, kindergarten enrollment and births have been fairly steady, fairly stable. Now the uh, gray dotted line represents current school year. So everything to the right of the gray dotted line are those are that maroon line are births that have happened in the past four years, but those babies haven't started kindergarten yet. So you can see that there's been a slight decline in births over the past four years. And so we anticipate that that can be related or, or, or uh, result in uh, smaller kindergarten classes in the next upcoming next few years. So let's talk about the current and the past students because this is our starting point uh, for all of our projections. This map represents the first step of our process, which is to uh, place every student enrolled in CIFAIR ISD on the map. And this work is actually done by your BPP pro, uh, department. And it's only because of its very um, uh, significant accuracy and historical accuracy that we're willing to use that as a starting point for our projections. And so every student is a, a, a dot on the map. And the only, so in, in this case, the green dots are the current students. The only time you see green is in an area where no students, no neighborhoods, no houses existed three years ago. So examples are Marvita and the new sections of Bridgeland and Dunham Point, for example. So this is our starting point, where every student lives in the district currently and where they have lived in the past. Now, because we know where every student lives, we compare that to the number of houses in each neighborhood to get a ratio of students per home. And this allows us to understand which neighborhoods are becoming more and less dense with students as the population ages. So district-wide, 0.58 students per home, that's the average across the district, but that varies widely in different subdivisions. For example, Bridgeland has 0.84 students per home, more, certainly more student dense, and um, more established neighborhoods like Copperfield have 0.44 students per home. So the reason we do this is so that we can um, establish comparables for the new housing construction so that we can understand how many students will be yielded from those new houses that are under construction. So let's talk very briefly about the economy and the housing market and how that, of course, plays a major role in enrollment growth. So the, the past housing trends illustrate how um, the record low mortgage rates uh, during the pandemic had the intended effect, the intentional effect of stimulating the economy overall. And it resulted in specifically in new housing construction boom. So, but as interest rates uh, increased in 2022 and 2023, the housing market cooled, of course, um, as shown here, both as uh, new home construction and uh, home resale of existing homes. 
So the, the cooling of the housing market in both of those categories resulted in the deceleration of uh, enrollment in CIFAIR ISD, another um, factor, as I mentioned before, that has contributed to the, um, the deceleration of growth. Now, importantly, on the right side of the map, the graph on the right illustrates how fewer homes have been resold in recent years, likely due to unmotivated sellers who are holding on to their 3% mortgages, right? So this impacts uh, CIFAIR enrollment because those homes that are inhabited by empty nesters with their 3% mortgages, those homes don't have the opportunity to regenerate or turn over with a younger family to be occupied by a family with children like they have in the past. So the normal amount of regeneration that we, have, we see in established neighborhoods hasn't happened as much over the past year or two. And so therefore we've seen slightly fewer students in some of these established neighborhoods. Now let's talk about new housing construction. The, um, the west side of the district, of course, is the hot spot for new housing growth all along the Grand Parkway corridor. Uh, the, the remainder of the district is largely built out as far as large developable um, uh, plots of land, parcels of land that could become single family homes. So listed here are the um, biggest developments projected to add new uh, single family homes over the next 10 years. Again, all focused on the west side. Now, we also look at multifamily projections, and especially as, well, currently, currently there are 22 complexes, apartment complexes, under construction or leasing up throughout the district. And as the district builds out, as any district builds out, the number of uh, multifamily units becomes a greater proportion of the new housing um, market or, or, or um, contribution to the housing stock because there's simply, it can be infill on small parcels of land in an area that's otherwise built out. But it's important to remember that of, the, um, of these 18,000 or so new multifamily units that we project over the next 10 years, the number of students that will be yielded from those is much less than in uh, single family homes because of those ratios of students per home that we saw earlier. So as a result, although multifamily units contribute to 50% of the housing um, uh, unit stock, it only contributes about 30% of the new students projected. Now where are those um, multifamily units projected to happen? This is, these are the 22 that I mentioned that are either under construction or leasing up. And as you can see on the map, they're scattered all over the district. And this is typical of um, established and building out uh, uh, districts because there are small parcels of land that can be developed it, by infill with a new uh, multifamily. Uh, development. So overall, over the next 10 years, we're projecting 35,000, almost 200 new housing occupancies. This is not students, this is housing units. So before you panic, these are, how, these are the number of new housing units. A little less than half of those are projected to be single family, and a little more than half are projected to be multifamily over 10 years. Now let's talk about students. We've heard a lot about housing, but let's talk about how we um, develop this model for student enrollment projections. There are a lot of factors and a lot of assumptions that go into these uh, projections. We've talked about new housing construction and that certainly uh, drives the majority of, of the growth in the district. We've talked about birth rates and how the last four years have seen a dip in birth rates. The, the most recent year has seen a, a, an increase in births that could manifest in about uh, fall of 27 when those kids hit kindergarten. But it's important that we look at the incoming class size for kindergartners because it's affected by births, it's also affected by everything else, um, new housing construction, et cetera, but that incoming cohort of kindergartners will then affect 12 years worth of enrollment increases or decreases depending on if it's a, a bulge or a, a, a smaller class. 
We look at regeneration of homes, existing homes with younger families, which neighborhoods are holding on to their empty nesters and which are selling to younger families. And then we always have to uh, keep an eye on charter schools as well as new charter schools move into a district and what impact that could have on future enrollment. So the actual PIMS, or, so first of all, every year we refocus, recalibrate, and update the assumptions. All of those factors that I mentioned have assumptions associated with those, and those assumptions have to change year to year. And so that re refocus and recalibration is facilitated by communication with your BPP department. Um, and so these are the numbers that uh, Scott referred to earlier in that actual enrollment at the PM snapshot date in these five years of the 12 historical years that we worked with CIFAIR. Overall has been plus or minus 0.2% within our projected uh, mod gro moderate growth scenario. So the three uh, beige lines you see represent our low growth, moderate growth, and high growth scenario. And the maroon is the actual enrollment. And so as you can see in year one, that, the, that projected versus actual enrollment is within 0.2%. Year two is within 0.7%, and years three through five are between one and 2% of, um, of actual enrollment. So this also leads me to explain our three scenarios of growth from here into the future for the next 10 years. Every year, as I mentioned, we start from, fret, from, from scratch and we reassess all of those assumptions and, and those factors and what has happened in the past year that changes those assumptions so that we can update our projections. And so the mod, moderate growth scenario is our most likely, based on everything we know today, this is what we think is the most likely scenario of growth for the next 10 years. And then the low and the high growth scenarios have their own sets of assumptions if these factors were to change. And so those low and high scenarios bracket in a realistic expectation of what enrollment could look like within the next 10 years. So let's talk now about where in the district um, that growth and decline is projected to happen. So over the next 10 years, uh, this heat map shows in dark red the areas of growth, highest growth, and in blue the areas of decline. So of course all the new housing that we talked about along the west side, along the Grand Parkway uh, corridor, is, um, is all of that new housing is driving that growth as seen in the red areas. But also notice that there's small pockets of both growth and decline all over the district. So we then take this growth and decline projection and aggregate it into the uh, attendance zones for each school. So first let's look at elementary. And we see that, again, on the west side, the highest growth in the elementary schools um, is along the west side. But again, there are some blue schools that are projected to have fewer students over the next 10 years. But how does this growth in population relate to the schools and, and their capacities, and how much can the schools um, accommodate and handle this growth? So this map looks at utilization of elementary schools. And by utilization, I mean the number of students in, projected to be enrolled next fall compared to the capacity, the permanent capacity, no, no portables, um, of each of these schools. And so I draw your attention to the legend. And notice that from gray to dark red represents underutilized to heavily utilized schools. Now I draw your attention to the map. There is no gray or dark red on the map for next year. And that is because for next fall, none of the schools are projected to be severely under or overutilized. Now let's look 10 years into the future. If no new schools are built, nothing changes. If we compare the number of students projected to live in each attendance zone to the capacity of the existing schools now, of course we see some areas um, of both, uh, we, well we see a bifurcation in 10 years compared to what we have right now. Some schools are dark red, overutilized, and some schools are gray or underutilized. And so over the next 10 years, 
Some elementary schools, some new elementary schools will be needed, um, but other areas in the district could also have available capacity. And so similar to other districts um, with large capacities, SciFair has areas of future growth and areas that are built out. And this is very common in large districts. It will be important for the district to plan uh, strategic uh, timelines for the new uh, campuses uh, to assure, ensure that the district is addressing this growth. But also at the same time, it's important to find creative ways to utilize the existing campuses. Now let's move on to the middle school level. Again, we see growth on the west side uh, with the, over the next 10 years, growth and decline over the next 10 years. You'll notice that the cream colored attendance zones are plus or minus 100 student change over the next 10 years. So that's basically stable. That is basically most of the district at the middle school level um, will, is projected to remain fairly stable. The high growth in the west, um, of course, with the construction. But how does this relate to uh, the capacities of each school? Again, take a look at the uh, legend with, um, with the underutilization and overutilization. So next fall, most of the middle schools are all pretty well utilized, and there is no dark red overutilization next fall. Ten years out, the growth in the west, of course, um, we, we're seeing just like at the elementary level. But this district has been particularly proactive about making boundary adjustments in advance of crisis overcrowding situations um, in order to best use the e existing uh, facilities. And that will likely be the solution over the next 10 years at the middle school level because the overcrowding is not um, projected to be um, wildly um, unmanageable. And so it's likely to be the solution to the next 10 years worth of um, moderate uh, handling the overcrowding um, rather than needing to build new attendant, uh, new element, uh, middle schools, excuse me. So finally, let's look at the high school. Again, we're looking at um, some uh, schools with projected growth and some schools with projected uh, fewer uh, students, but how does this relate to the capacities of each campus? And then finally, I am starting to feel like a broken record. Look at the, um, at the legend. Next year, there is not projected to be any terribly underutilized or overutilized high schools. And a, a large part of that is because of the district's proactive effort in rezoning before the, the overcrowding reaches a, cr a crisis state. So the uh, recent rezoning at the high school level has balanced the short-term and the long-term um, uh, utilization of Bridgeland, Cy Ranch, and Cy Woods, for example. So let's talk about in 10 years. The, um, as I mentioned, the rezoning has postponed the need for some kind of additional capacity um, in, in the northwest part of the district. Uh, specifically, Cy Woods is projected to need some, some kind of capacity relief by about 2028, which is a significant postponement compared to prior to the rezoning effort. And Cy Park will be shortly after that. And so the current landscape, however, for school funding and increasing construction costs, et cetera, creates the need <coughs> for a discussion within the district about how to best accommodate this projected growth, particularly at the high school level, um, over the next decade. And so with this, I will close tonight with the, you've been very patient, thank you very much. I'll close tonight with the summary that SciFair continues to mature and face new growth patterns that you haven't seen in the past and changing student population densities. And so we just look forward to a continued partnership with SciFair and the BPP department specifically um, as we help you navigate these new waters. So with that, I can take any questions. Thank you very much. Very thorough presentation. Any questions from the board? Start from the right. I have a question. Uh, thank you for the information, very detailed and very helpful, and I'm a realtor, so I love to see this, the demographics and the, the uh, housing information is extremely helpful and informative. Um, I just have a question. Did y'all help with the, in the 2014, we had a bond that was proposed, and there were demographics that were used in that time for that bond proposal. Were y'all part of that with the information you submitted? 
We did a study for the district um, in, in that year. Yes, our first year was in 2012, 2013. Um, I am not familiar with how that data was incorporated into the bond planning. I, I, I wasn't okay. involved in that part. I okay. did the, the data. The projection in the 2014 bond was that we would grow and gain 35,000 students over the last 10 years from 2013 to 2023. And we, in fact, gained about 8,000 students. So I was just curious if anybody could provide some information or insight on how that number was so such a disparity. So, um, so there are a lot of answers to that. And, um, and as I mentioned, every year has a set of factors and a set of assumptions uh, that we have to make based on what's the best guess about what's going to happen. And we... Um, talk about the first five years as our um, the, the, the years in which we have the most confidence in our projections. And as I mentioned, that has been borne out in the past in, uh, uh, five years of uh, enrollment versus project, projected enrollment within one or two percent um, in those five in those within the first five years. Now, the, in the last five years of the projection period, we include as benchmark data because in order to plan ahead for future facilities, which you were needing to do at the, to, at the time in 2013 and 14 when you were growing like gangbusters, um, so if we can only look five years in advance, and that doesn't give the district time enough to plan in advance for acquiring school sites and um, passing bond elections, et cetera. And so we use that benchmark data um, to give you an idea of what could happen. But again, you remember that uh, delta between the low and mod high uh, growth scenarios. And so um, that bra uh, brackets in the, the uh, level of uncertainty, so to speak. And with all of that being said, since 2014, I think the biggest answer to your question is the pandemic. I mean, there's just no way that anybody could have predicted the, uh, the global pandemic and the effect that it had on, on everything, including uh, enrollment. Okay, um, that's, some of that information I think is helpful. Um, I guess it's just kind of shocking to think that we were gonna gain 35,000 students was projected and we only gained 8,000. Um, I pulled up the uh, presentation made with um, the Long Range Planning Committee during the 2014 bond, and what the presentation shows uh, at the time in 2013-14, our enrollment was 111, 284, and our projected enrollment uh, for students by 2020 was 15,618. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure the number, um, where the number of 30, 35,000 was in the bond proposal package that was put together. There was a projection of a the growth of 35,000 students. Okay. Okay. I'll pull that up. I don't, um, I don't, rec okay. I'll, I'll look for that. Yeah. It was ba based, we used PASS as information that they provide us, provided us, but I'll just need to clarify exactly how that data was uh, presented and shared. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you so much. I appreciate the information, it's very helpful. Yes, um, thanks again for the information. Uh, we've had a little time to digest it. And, you know, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that the projected growth on the west side is where a lot of the focus is going to be. But I also found it very interesting in some of um, the decline in enrollment. Um, what factors went into projecting decline in certain areas? Or were we projecting these areas are going to be uh, more older neighborhoods with empty nesters? Is it something where maybe kids are moving from one school to the other, but we're not necessarily losing schools? Excuse me, we're not necessarily losing kids overall. Maybe they're just moving from one school to the other. Can you go into a little bit into what factors went into decline projections in enrollment areas? Sure. Sure, and, and I talked about some of those in talking about the factors that go into the projections overall. Um, so birth rate is a big, is a big part of that. Um, and looking at um, historically how big the kindergarten class has been in each of the, each school, um, and that gives us an idea if the kindergarten is getting smaller by 10 students every year, 
then when we project that forward, if we were to continue that trend all the way out, that would, that would be no, no elementary, I mean, no kindergarten students left. So of course we don't make those kinds of assumptions, but we do um, look at, at past trends of younger students coming in when there are fewer and fewer kindergartners, so maybe the kindergarten class is a little bit smaller than the first grade class is a little bit smaller than the second grade class, then as those older students age out, the fifth graders leave and go to middle school, and a smaller kindergarten class comes in, well, that elementary school is going to decline in population. And so trends of existing students and past students is a big, a big one. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, the regeneration of uh, existing homes, established neighborhoods with younger families. And we don't track where students move from and to, but we do look at the, re at the overall numbers of second graders in one year and third graders in the next year and fourth graders in the next year. So which neighborhoods are gaining or losing students um, in those homes that are not building any, any new construction? So those are the two major factors. Thank you. <clears throat> I was at um, at Walker Elementary School this past in the last couple of weeks, and also at Sheridan, as a matter of fact. And one of the comments were made were that people were buying houses. Pardon me. People were living in houses through different means, where now we're seeing leases that are two-year leases. And so the buying patterns are shifting. <clears throat> People are not staying in houses in some cases for a long term. How does that factor into your analysis where you have people that might rotate in and out of houses? So that affects the principals and the, the staff at the campuses a lot more than it affects us because that's a transient population. So those students are coming and going and they're having to um, deal with all of the issues associated with a new set of students every year or two. Um, from our perspective, however, we look at number of bodies and how old they are. And it doesn't really matter to our model whether that's the same second grade to third grade to fourth grader or if those are new students coming in or out. So we're looking at the trends of the, of the bodies um, as opposed to which ones are moving in and out. Okay. Um, and then lastly, just a comment um, and for the viewing public, this partnership on doing these studies with your firm has, goes back roughly a decade, but during that time we've seen such explosive growth. And while there's been, you know, to your point, Christine, there's been deviations from plan to action, we've also relied on that heavily when we think about how to balance the needs of our schools against our communities to better utilize our assets. So it's working with your organization has been helpful in helping us look down the road to make some of the hard decisions about where do we need to staff and how best to utilize our assets in our schools themselves. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Tapera, it's Tapera, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. I hate it when people mess up my last name. So, uh, aging out on the east side of, of the school district currently, right? So, um, Current events going on. Obviously, we have we have pe an influx of people that are that are coming into our country right now. Has that taken uh, been taken into account? To you know, is that going to obviously it's, we're going to increase numbers? Is that is that something that that you guys have looked at? Uh, yes, on a global scale, on a specific neighborhood scale, not particularly because again we're looking at um, trends of, of of bodies in in homes as opposed to which ones are new and which ones have been there for a while. Thank you. Go ahead, Julie. Uh, thank you very much for the information. We always um, appreciate having this good data to help us make our decisions and our, um, as we plan ahead. Just as you said to, at the beginning, it's important that we've always taken a strategic approach um, I appreciate the validation that the hard decisions that we made last year regarding changing attendance zones um, had a positive impact in that it delayed the need for new construction, which is very expensive uh, for our taxpayers. So um, although that was a hard decision to have to make, um, uh, we, I appreciate that we do see the positive side of that in that um, it, we were able to delay construction 
uh, the need for another bond program um, and such. But uh, clearly this information will help us make decisions uh, on planning for the future. So thank you. Thank you. I just have one last question um, for you. Uh, when you're looking at the numbers, I was to make sure I understand this completely. I know we have a, a multi-generational family sometimes in houses that stay there longer, which is fine. We also have a homeless population or a transient population before moving and going. You're looking at how many kids are in the schools. Is that where you gather the data from to get the home variations? I'm going to make sure I, how, how you tr extrapolate that number of people in, in, in schools. So we start with your database of, of students okay. and their home addresses. I thought. And yes, and those are placed on the map based on where they live. And so if you're asking about the ratios of students per home, every student is placed on the map Great. on a parcel, and then we know how many students and how many homes are in that neighborhood. Great. I thought you did that. That's making sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now proceed with the consent agenda items of the portion of the agenda. 6A, uh, the board consider approving the minutes from March 4th, 2024. And that was changed, correct, Holly? The one made change from Christine? The one change was made on that uh, agenda? Thank you. Or two changes. Thank you. Uh, 6B, the board consider approving second readings or additions on district policies. Uh, 6B1, FL, student records, private. I mean, it's going to be revised. Uh, 6C, the board consider approving Centerpoint Energy Houston Electric Blanket Easement to provide underground electricity service at Hallbrook Elementary to authorize the superintendent to negotiate final terms and execute the related documents. 6D, the board consider approving minutes proposals and paid from bond funds, recommended contractors, authorize the superintendent to execute all necessary documents related to 6D1, Cypher uh, High School renovation, 6D2. Uh, ELC 1, ELC 2, ELC Bar Barker Cypress and Falcon Annex. 6E, the board consider approving authorizing the superintendent designated for miscellaneous professional services contracts related to the 2022 Cy Fair High School renovation project. Then 6F, the board consider approving resolution uh, to join and participate in an interlock agreement between the Region 4 Service Center and authorize the superintendent to ex execute all necessary documents for an inter interlocal agreement. If any board member wishes to move one or more items for a further discussion, please do so this time. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consensus items as uh, recommended or amended. So moved, Mr. President. Second. Second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. And that would be one missing, so six, one abstention. We will now proceed with the non-consent agenda items. The board are considering uh, the adoption of the order authorizing the assurance of, uh, <clears throat> of Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District's unlimited tax school building and refund, uh, refunding bonds, which may be issued in one or more services, levying a tax providing for the security and payment thereof, providing for the award and sale thereof in accordance with specified parameters, enacting other provisions related to thereof. Did you write that, Karen? I would say our bond council wrote that. <laughs> I thought maybe Marnie wrote it. Uh, may I have a motion, please? Mr. President, I actually have a few questions on that before. Or do you, you want to go ahead and entertain a motion and then have questions, or are you, are you allowing questions before the motion? We have to do motion first. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda item. You have a second? Second. Are there any questions now at this time? Uh, yeah, I, I want to just touch base on something that uh, Karen and I discussed uh, last Monday as well. And you've heard several of us speak, and Dr. Killian and Karen speak as well, about talking about using some of our um, reserve balance to shore up our budget going into the next year. And Karen, I wanted to touch base with you one more time on, can you can you give us a little insight? Because you know, we're talking about going out for bond, bonds and the actual uh, interest rate and the associated with that. Can you give us a little bit of um, insight into the correlation between having a healthy fund balance and the actual rates when we go out for bonds and how those two interplay? Absolutely. 
Um, first of all, we start, we have what's called um, we, the rate that we get because of the permanent school fund. And uh, that rating is a AAA rating because we have the permanent school fund backing uh, through the, that the state of Texas has. But then we have what's called an underlying rating. And that underlying rating is what actually affects maybe the interest rates that we might have whenever we go and sell bonds. So that underlying rating is what impacts that is a multitude of things. But one of them is fund balance. And so they look to see if they feel like you can meet your obligations, if you've got a healthy enough fund balance, if something happens in that particular year uh, that you can recover from it or you've got a plan. So for example, I think one of the things you were asking me about was, um, you, is how far we can go into fund balance each year maybe and still be okay with the rating agencies. So they like to be able to see that you've got, for example, this year, or this, this next year, they wouldn't want us to see us go into fund balance for the whole deficit because then they're going, okay, next year, what are you going to do because you've already gone into fund balance for that. So they like to be able to see that you've got a plan that will carry you usually three to five years out is what they ask us for whenever they're talking to me about um, our financial plans is three to five years out. But they want to make sure that you've got options the next year if you go into fund balance. So for example, if we go into fund balance 70 million, like we indicated is a potential possibility, well then we still have, you know, fund balance that we can go into and still meet our obligations of uh, the fund balance policy by the next year. And they see that we can do that. So that makes them not have as much concern um, if you go into fund balance, if you have more capacity in the future years also. So in other words, we, we could use our entire fund balance to pay off the, in the, the entire debt. However, for bond evaluation purposes, it's going to behoove us to stagger that and have that as part of a staggered plan over several years to make sure that we have that financial health necessary to get the beneficial rates that we're looking for. You're correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, because, and, and it's also important for us to restate that the importance of those beneficial rates are going to have a positive impact on our uh, overall financial health as well. That's less money the district has to pay, which is, you know, more money in the district. Correct. It saves the taxpayer. Correct. So mm -hmm. thank you. for. I just, wanted, I just wanted us to touch base on that one more time about how important it is for us to, you know, monitor and use our fund balance wisely as it uh, attains to the, as it attests to the overall financial health of the district and how that affects our bond rates and how bond rates have a long-term effect on how much the district actually has to pay. You are correct. Thank you, Karen. Any other discussion? You may. Um, that was a great question, and that's one reason why when I've been talking about um, addressing the deficit, I'm looking at it as a three-year pattern um, so that we don't exhaust the fund balance, and we also have another legislative session in the middle of there, uh, an opportunity if we need to go to a, for a VATRE to our taxpayers and other negotiations we have on the local optional homestead exemption. So that was a great point. Seeing no more questions, we'll now take a vote. All in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. May I, may I just ask you one thing? Do you mind on the motion to make sure we read the motion as it's written only because our, we uh, amended it to include uh, the conversion of the variable rate bonds? And I want to be sure that part uh, is said, if you don't mind. Excuse me. Mr. President, I'm fine restating the motion. I'll read the motion as recommended. Uh, I move that the board approve the order authorizing the issuance of Cypress Firebanks Independent School District Unlimited Tax School Building and Refunding Bonds, which may be issued in one or more series, levying a tax and providing for the security and payment thereof, providing for the award of the sale thereof in accordance with specified parameters and enacting other provisions relating thereto. It's actually the motion piece, not the agenda item. That is, that's, that's it, that is the recommended motion. Did you want to update them? We had an updated motion. Yeah, just if you may recall, after some of the um, discussion with Bond Council, we had talked about if we do not um, refund, then we would um, 
we would con do a convert to a new rate period with a variable rate bond. So we did update the, so I suggested that we update the motion. And so uh, my apologies for not bringing that um, to your attention, but that way it was clear that you had an either or, we you were authorizing us to do either or at bond council's recommendation. So just so we're clear, we're, we're amending the motion at this point. And, and procedurally, there was no there was no second on my previous motion, so I will I will amend amend my motion as well for the suggested motion in compliance with Bond Council's recommendation. A motion I move to approve an author or an order authorizing the issuance of Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District Unlimited Tax School Building and refunding bonds, which may be issued in one or more series, and an order authorizing the conversion of Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District Variable Rate Unlimited Tax School Building Bonds Series 2015B-1 and 2015B-2 to new rate periods as presented to the board. That's my motion, Mr. President. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Any questions at this point on the amended motion? Seeing none, we'll now take a vote on that amended motion. Please signify by raising your right hand. And that's seven zero. Seven B, the, the board will consider approving the superintendent's contract recommendations to issue probationary term and annual contracts for the 2024-2025 school year for teachers, administrators, and professionals. We have a motion, please. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the superintendent's contract recommendations for the 2024-2025 school year. And we have a second? Second. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none on that, can I take a vote? Please speak to my raising your right hand. And the vote is seven to zero. 7D has been removed from the agenda. 7E, the board will consider adopting the Resolution to modify the adjustment to Comptroller's property value assessment for granting a local optional homestead exemption. At this time, I'll now entertain a motion. Mr. President, I move that the board adopt a resolution to modify adjustment in the Comptroller's property. Am I in the wrong one? <clears throat> Go ahead. Seeing no second, we'll now take another motion. Mr. President, I'd like to make a, um, I'd like to amend the motion. I'd like to amend the you agenda item. open second, so you can just go ahead and make a motion. You want to go make a, I'll go ahead and, hold on a second. So your, the chair's recommendation is to make a motion on the agenda there item. There was no second, so. Okay. Well, then, I, then I, I want to make a motion to actually amend the agenda item. Correct. So then I'm going to make a motion to amend the agenda item. Correct. And then we can make a motion on the amended amended um, on the amended agenda item if the amendment passes. You and you may yeah. not need to do that. Just um, okay, I, can, I can just make a, a, a friendly recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you like me to make a motion yes. on the then we make, okay, Mr. President, I make a motion to approve the agenda item. Is it seven e? Okay. May I have a second? A second. Now we can open for questions, discussion. Um, so, in addition to our parliamentary exercise, I'd like to make a, <laughs> I'd like to make a recommendation uh, to add some language to the motion. The Excuse me for the resolution. Thank you. I would like to add the following language to follow after the second whereas clause. I'll read the. I'll read the first two whereas clauses, then I would like to add some additional language. The first two whereas clauses as the agenda before the trustees reads, whereas Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District CFISD is made, maintaining a low administrative cost ratio of focus of its operations, making CFISD one of the five lowest administrative cost districts in the state consistently, and whereas CFISD has focused on taxpayer relief. Each year since 1983, when the Board of Trustees adopted a local a uh, local optional homestead exemption equal to 20% of the taxable property values is appraised by the Harris County Central Appraisal District. I would like to add the following link, uh, the following whereas clause. Whereas Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District reaffirms its commitment to property tax relief and a local homestead exemption for CyFair taxpayers. Any questions or discussion on that? Any, anyone objects to that? 
I don't, I, no, I, I agree with that. Um, I appreciate um, uh, the uh, amendment, the added phrase, as well as the additional language that was added since um, our meeting on Monday. Um, uh, that makes the resolution more understandable by the majority of our stakeholders, so I appreciate that addition. Um, one thing I would suggest um, in the future is that um, the resolution be posted publicly so that people know what we're talking about in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the resolution wasn't even read on Monday, um, so and it still hasn't been read, and people still don't know what we're, we're talking about. So I, I would just encourage that in the, for the sake of transparency that the, when we're looking at resolutions that they be shared publicly, <coughs> forward-facing, and or read into the minutes. So let's read them into the minutes at this point, if that's okay. I don't know that we need to. I mean, I don't know that you need to read them into the minutes. We can certainly read them so people hear what you're talking yeah. about, or we can post them. But Let's I make sure we post them in the future. Yeah. Um, or or we could even have them, you know, up while we're talking. So Let's please have them in board book if that's a possible, Holly, in the future. And we can. Right, public facing. We make did have facing. something on the uh, tax page. Uh, it's on the tax um, portion. It, it's the same resolution as last year. It did not change, just the date would change. And that's been posted for a year on the website on the tax um, page. Let's go ahead and finish reading it then. I'll restate uh, the amended language and I'll finish the resolution. The amended language includes, whereas Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District reaffirms its commitment to property tax relief and a local homestead exemption for Cyfair taxpayers, and whereas the focus on taxpayer relief and low administrative cost ratios have resulted in a loss of state aid due to providing a local homestead exemption and whereas under Texas Education Code TEC section 48.002, the purpose of this foundation school program, FSP, is to guarantee that each school district in the state has adequate resources to provide students with a basic instructional program suitable to the student's educational needs and whereas under TEC section 48.251, the foundational school program is financed by state available school funds distributed in accordance for law, ad valorem tax revenue generated by local school district effort, and state funds appropriated for the purposes of public school education, and whereas under TEC section 48.256, each school district's local share of the S FSP is determined by a formula equal to the product of the local school's adopted tier one maintenance and operations tax rate applied to the district's taxable property values is determined by government code section 403.302 and whereas tax code section 11.13N provides an additional residential home section if the exemption is adopted by the governing body of the taxing unit and whereas CFISD, the maximum benefit and whereas the taxable property values used for allocating state funding to school districts under the FSP as determined by government code section 403.302 subsection D2 and TCEC sections 48.259 does not reflect the local homestead exemption adopted by the school district governing body resulting in a loss of millions of dollars annually in state FSP funding and whereas section TEC section 48.259 prohibits the commissioner of education providing f funding under the section unless funds are specifically appropriated for the purposes of the section or the total amount of state funds appropriated for the FSB exceeds the amount distributed to school districts based on the taxable values of property without any deduction for the residents homes that exemptions granted under tax, tax code section 11.13 n causing a tremendous loss of funds to an efficiently low tax district and be it resolved, the Board of Trustees of the Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District calls for the modification of the adjustment in Comptroller's property value assignment by not recognizing any amount of the local optional homestead exemption granted under Texas Tax Code Section 11.13 N for purposes of state funding under FSP by repealing TEC Section 48.259. Amending Government Code Section 403.302 Sections D2 as follows, quote, the total dollar amount of any resident's homestead exemption granted under Section 11.13 N tax code in a year that is subject to the study of each district, end quote, and fully funding an administratively efficient district that provides local tax relief beyond the state's ability. Nobody said res resolutions had to be short. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Any other further discussion on this? So Karen, so we get this correct, do we need to restate the motion or just take a vote at this point? We will correct it for you. Okay. Thank you. This time we'll take a vote on the, uh, the amended resolution as read by Mr. Justin Ray. All those in favor, please speak by raising your right hand. 
And a seven zero vote again. Thank you very much. 7F, the board will consider approving the superintendent's recommendation to give notice to the individual listed here. Her employment with the district under probationary contract is proposed for termination. Authorize the president of the board to notify the individual proposed action pursuant to section uh, 21.104 of the Texas Educator Code. This item was discussed in closed section, closed session pursuant to section 551.074. May I have a motion this time, please? I move that the Board of Trustees approve the recommendation to notify that employee of their employment with the district uh, under probationary contract is proposed for termination and to provide her notice of the same in accordance with the law. We may have a second. A second. All those in, any questions? Excuse me. Seeing none, we'll now take a vote. All those in favor, please begin by raising your right hand. And the vote is 7-0. 7G, the board consider approving the superintendent's recommendation to give notice to the individual listed here. Bulma, the district is under probationary contract is proposed for termination and authorize the board, board president to notify the individual of the proposed action pursuant to 21.104 Texas Educator Code. This item was disclosed, dis, was discussed in closed section session pursuant to section 551.074. May I have a motion, please. I make a motion to, for the Board of Trustees to approve the recommendation to notify the employer, employee of his employment with the district under probationary contract as proposed for termination and to provide him with notice of the same in accordance with the law. Thank you. May I have a second? A second. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll now take a vote. Please sing by raising your right hand. And the vote is 7-0. 7-H, the Board consider making termination a good cause to not exist as required by law for the individuals listed in the board agenda to resign their respective employment contracts. This item was discussed in closed session pursuant to section 551.074. May I have a motion, please. Mr. President, I move that the Board of Trustees render a finding under Texas Administrative Code Chapter 249.17 subsection D that good cause did not exist as required by the Texas Education Code sections 21.105 subsection C, 21.160 subsection C, or 21.210 subsection C for the employees listed here <coughs> to resign their respective employment contracts and notify these employees in accordance with the law that the district is submitting a complaint to the State Board of Education certification for contract abandonment. May I have a second, please? Second. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll now take a vote. Please sign by raising your right hand. And the vote is 7-0. We'll now move proceed to informational items. At this time, we'll get board committee updates. Uh, to my left, I know Christine has some updates first. The Academic Safety Vision and Planning Committee met um, with this just this last week, actually. Uh, we received a report from Chief Mendez. It was very detailed um, regarding student safety, uh, traffic, uh, violations and safety recommendations and concerns. Uh, we also had uh, uh, an informational uh, information provided uh, by Christina Cole on the SHAC. Uh, we're still determining those data needs uh, to provide more information on our website to provide more transparency to our uh, families in the district. And then we also uh, provided, uh, talked about an update on the board monitoring system. And that was for a uh, progress report of goal two, objective one of the board monitoring system. And that also, uh, Dr. Macias also introduced the two-way dual language pilot program. We're very excited about that and can't wait to see that get kicked off. Thank you. Natalie, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm pleased to bring a report from the Ad Hoc Teacher Retention and Recruitment Committee. The goal of the committee is to explore the best ways to keep and attract great teachers here in SIF. Uh, site fair, um, and to address the needs of our 8,358 teachers, um, we want to make sure that we're the best place for them to teach our amazing students. At our first meeting on February 8th, the committee reviewed teacher retention and mobility data, pathways to education careers, much like the beautiful young ladies who were honored and young gentlemen who were honored here today in the teaching organizations, both students and um, uh, other paraprofessionals and others, uh, other pathways into teaching. Um, the T, we also looked at uh, the vacancy task force data from TEA and the status of our teacher incentive allotment. 
and we did a SWOT analysis on that to identify opportunities, and I am thank the administration for getting to work right away on developing a few of the ideas that were generated at that first meeting. We held our second meeting on March 27th. Um, we aimed at understanding um, aimed at understanding the demands and figuring out how to avoid burnout for our teachers. We reviewed some data that we, um, thanks to uh, Teresa Hall and her team um, from Hanover. Uh, we looked at a teacher time study. Um, the key objectives of the study were to identify non-direct instructional tasks that were required of teachers, to determine the time required for each of these tasks and the perceived importance to our teachers, and to ID key differences in perception across the and within different instructional groups. We had 1,043 respondents, and they were all instructional staff specifically. Um, there was also a teacher time study um, focus groups. So it was not quite as well participated in, but it did yield us some very interesting information uh, around what teachers perceive um, as useful, not useful, um, and uh, use of their time and priorities. So we'll continue to analyze that data to make the best decisions we can um, to be the best place to teach in the state of Texas. Um, we also uh, discussed use of exit surveys, uh, to continue to use those and to develop those to this year as we look at the findings of anyone we lose out of our teaching workforce. Um, also, our superintendent and team looked at um, the retiree hire option uh, that came out of that ideas in the first to see if TRS retirees would be able to uh, look at paying the penalty so that they would, people who still want to teach and who are expert and experienced teachers might have an opportunity to re-enter the workforce with us. Um, uh, teacher marketing plans under development, highlighting pathways and options in SciFair, uh, you know, extended for people to understand the uh, great place it is to teach. Um, and then also we looked at a teacher retention program proposal to pilot offering a stipend for hard to staff campuses that meet the certain criteria, um, a high number of economically disadvantaged students, ones that are situated in the perimeter of the district, creating challenges for the commute of the teachers, and also ones that are experiencing um, low teacher retention rates. Um, the goal would be, of course, as data shows, to meet the challenge of improving academic performance with really that consistency in teachers, being able to train them and keep them at the campus, and also be able to market those schools to other teachers that are highly effective in our school district. So we'll continue to gather feedback. We've got some groups of teachers identified to um, to uh, dig in deeper, to ask questions of, and we seek any feedback from educators. Our committee is open to ideas and input so that we can make sure we hear all voices and making it the best place to teach. Thank you. I know Todd gave his update during his board comments. Anyone else? I do. Go ahead. So for the Finance and Operations Subcommittee, we met this past month, and we discussed the following topics. <clears throat> we reviewed the plan from administration on how they would message to and collaborate with the community members on the Budget Reduction Advisory Committee that met, that has met this month. We discussed key topics to bring forth, what type of feedback we wanted to elicit, the, the timeline upon which they would meet the types of outputs they would have from their meetings. We discussed also the status of the optional homestead exemption communications that we're having with legislature and the Commissioner of Education and the feedback that we've received thus far. <clears throat> After we met as a subcommittee, we have had those budget reduction advisory committee meetings. Those meetings were taken seriously as we've already discussed. Feedback from the larger community is still being reviewed by those committees and they are in process of providing their recommendations and feedback to our administration. We've already heard the update from Dr. Killian on our approach for requesting the legislature to recognize the tax relief the district has offered since 1983 mm -hmm. with the 20% local optional homestead exemption and provide our full state funding as well, gaining support with our legislative team and the Commissioner of Education on gaining back 50% of the funding from the local optional homestead exemption. And you've all heard the resolution that we are going to send forth as part of that exercise. We are working to give our students the best opportunity for their education while being responsible stewards of our budget. Thank you to our administration, our staff, our budget reduction advisory committee members, and the larger community for all the feedback. We also want to give a special shout out to our Texas legislative team. They are listening and we are collaborating with them actively. We are going to work through this process of reducing our deficit and securing a stronger financial position for the coming years. Thank you very much for our entire team, and we look forward to uh, working together for, with you for the rest of the year. Yes, go ahead, Dan. I did want to make one more comment. Our board, that's all the committees, correct? 
That's correct. Okay, I want to make sure. I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to the Sidewoods Wildcats soccer. The boys are advancing in UIL and they will play tomorrow in against Tyler Legacy in Round Rock. And so I just want to uh, tell the 212 fans, best of luck. Go get them. Let's win state. Great. Any, uh, any information updates that from the board they'd like to discuss at this time? Uh, seeing none, the discussion portion of the agenda was reviewed at the board work session on Monday. I would like to thank everyone for being here tonight, our principals in the audience, our administration staff, and also our patrons as well, and those who are viewing online. Thank you very much for hanging in there with us. I'd also like to thank all those who uh, are helping in the back, special Joel for giving us the pictures online as well. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, may I have a motion now this time to adjourn? President Henry, I motion that we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.